Well, as our good friend Christian likes to say, we're all doomed, right? That's right. We're all going to die. And well, technically that is true. There's actually a lot of living to do beforehand. And so today what we're going to talk about is we're going to recap some of the episodes that we've done. Where we've talked a little bit about some of the problems that are coming up with respect to monetary crisis, fiscal crisis, things like that. But we're going to go a little bit deeper into some of the good news, some of the ways that we could actually prevent these things from happening as a country or at the very, very least, survive in style. So we're going to be talking about all of that today and more. Plus, there's going to be a special portion of this episode where we're going to really need the audience participation. And so we hope you will help all of that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument. We are streaming on Rumble, the Making the Argument YouTube channel, and Nick Freitas' channel. You can leave comments in any of those locations, and we will be looking for them. We look forward to hearing what everyone has to say in the comment section because it is going to be a lot of fun. If you haven't already, go down to the link in the description. Sign up for our community chat. We would love to meet you there. We have some great conversations there as well and a lot of cool things coming up. But I'm going to hand it back over to Nick, and let's get going. All right, as always, I'm your host, Nick Freitas, member of the Virginia House of Delegates. But other than that, a reasonably good person. My beautiful bride, Tina, queen of the bees. Hello, everyone. I got in trouble because it sounded like I said beans last Because you did time. say beans, I and everybody beans. knows it. I, I, I went saw back, rewatched it. By the way, the comments on YouTube, it's like one of the most upvoted comments. <laughs> Like there, there's beans. all these there's all these like deep comments. It's like, man, I think R Christian really hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Obviously, I think it's deep because That's they deep. agree yeah. with me. Because they but agree with Christian. Yeah, I, I conveniently ignored the couple of people that agreed with you. But um, <laughs> either side of that debate, though, those were drowned out by this by by the one comment that just towered above all others, which was, "Oh, Nick totally said beans." There. <laughs> beans. What's funny is that because my name is Tina, people used to call me Teen and Bean. And anyway, See? long story short. Growing up, in my teen years, I was Bean. My dad called me Bean. Yeah. My, I had friends and family that called me Bean. And so it actually kind of works, I guess. So there you I go. Don't prefer Queen it, of the okay. Bees or Bean. And then, of course, we have our political prognosticator and resident historian, oh, Christian Hines. I thought you were about to say, and resident doomer. Yeah, um, you are a doomer. <laughs> that's, a new, that's a new term now. You're going to be our doomer. And then, of course, producer of producers, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. That's right, Nick. Let's get going. All righty. So, first things first. We've got to do kind of a recap here. Speaking so, of central banking... We're doomed. <laughs> so when, when we when we talk about, like, uh, obviously we're using kind of hyperbolic language with, like, coming apocalypse and stuff like that. But we have talked a lot on this show about various things that have happened politically, fiscally, monetarily, which are, are pretty bad. And it, it's not as if we can't look at some of these things and say, yeah, if you, if you print this much money, it's going to lead to inflation. And oh, by the way, if, you, if the government is spending out of control and setting up entitlement programs, which you can't possibly hope to pay without massively increasing taxes, that's going to have problems as well. And then you have a combination of these things happening all at once. And that's the sort of thing that generally leads to a lot of unrest within a country, a lot of uncertainty within a country. And so what we're talking about is... Why do we still think that's that's we're moving in that direction? I I tend to be the the resident optimist between my buddy Christian here. He he's more of the pessimist. I still think there's ways that we can we can kind of prevent this and upset the cycle that's happened so many times throughout history to other countries. Christian, not so much. But what we're going to talk about is in this first segment is okay. Why do we still think this is going to happen? And I I would say I think it's a a combination of monetary policy. I think monetary policy is one of the biggest ones and both Republicans and Democrats carry a lot of blame for this. All right. Monetary policy, because that leads to inflation. And if you really want to devastate an economy, once people lose faith in the currency, um, I mean that you just, it happens very, very quickly. Think, things that you never thought were possible within a civilized yeah. society happen very, very quickly. The moment people lose complete faith within the currency. So that that's, that's one issue. Another one is the, the fiscal side. It's the government being involved in, in so much and spending so much and be, people becoming more and more dependent upon these government programs and systems that are not very solvent right now. Let's be honest. It, it's actually kind of like the the reverse of that. Not reverse of it, but it's the other way around. It's it's the fiscal po bad fiscal policy is driving bad monetary policy in order accurate. to fund bad fiscal policy. Yeah, I think that's like but, because uh, but they're certainly interlinked. Yeah, I mean, well, we said there's three ways the government can actually get the right. It can take it through taxation. It can borrow it, or it can print it. And and like you said, it's the government spends so much money. They they spend more money than they take or borrow, and then they get 
And if they take any more, there's going to be a revolt because people don't want to, you know, pay ever increasing taxes. And then borrowing is dependent on people wanting to loan the government money. And when treasuries are in the toilet, people don't want to lend them the government money. So that only leaves printing left. And so I think you're right. It's, it's, we, we got way out, we got way out over our skis and you see this now with the, with the whole argument on the debt. And by the way, Babylon B put out something I thought was pretty funny. They said Republicans win the Emmy for pretending to care about the debt ceiling. And you know what? I, I agree with what, you know, the Republicans in Congress are doing right now on this fight with the debt ceiling. I, I at least agree that the fight needs to take place. We can argue all day long about where spending priorities should be, but Babylon B is absolutely correct that Republicans, I'm sorry, Republicans have also been guilty of raising the debt ceiling arbitrarily, you know, all the time. Nobody wants to get spending under control. And this is something where Christian articulated I think this very well. And I don't know if you want to, you know, talk a little bit more about this, but when we say, okay, well, if we know that inflation is bad and if we know that these things are, are problematic and we know this can lead to massive economic and, and societal unrest, well, then why don't we change it? Great question. <clears throat> no political will. Because I want you to imagine being the politician that's going to get up there and say, hey, guys, guess what? The government's not good at running your retirement account. And so Social Security has some fundamental flaws in it. All your political opponents are going to go out there and say, you don't want, you know, you want old people to be denied something they've paid into for their entire life. Or you want old people to, you know, get sick because you're not going to support government run health care. And you, and the person that makes those claims will win. And the person that actually says, hey, it's time to be adults. And we've got to recognize that the government's mismanaged a lot of this. And we've got to rethink what the government should be doing. That person loses. We all know what needs to be done. We do not know how to get elected or reelected once we've done it. And if you need proof of this, go back to 2012. Barack Obama defeated Mitt Romney by telling the American people that he, by attacking him, yeah. For wanting to cut federal funding for Big Bird. Yeah. <laughs> we are dealing with pathologically unserious people here. Mm -hmm. and not that I'm a huge Mitt Romney fan. Well, no, no. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that in 2012, I remember that was a campaign issue. That was an issue that was brought up in the debates. Yeah. Where, where Obama attacked Mitt Romney for wanting to cut federal funding to freaking PBS of all things. It was it was the if idea that should we have a should we have a, a media channel in the United in a free country, should you have a media channel that dependent on tax dollars for its survival. And, and Romney's position on that was basically why I, I think that we need to figure out a way to balance the budget. And that's certainly an, an, a relatively easy thing to cut more than, than say the military or social security. So why yeah. not ax that first? And then Obama attacked him on it and then he got reelected. And so like, I, I, like I said, we're dealing with pathologically unserious people here because quite frankly, Obama got reelected on literally campaigning on fiscally irresponsible policies. Donald Trump tried to get reelected. I'm going to, I'll, I, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to go out there and say it. He tried to get reelected on campaigning on fiscally irresponsible policies. People forget that a lot of the COVID bailout stuff was signed by him. Mm -hmm. A lot of the money that was printed was was printed under his watch. He was the one that, that publicly bullied the Federal Reserve into lowering interest rates. And so he contributed to the problem. And then Joe Biden gets into office. And what does he do? Does he get into office and say, man, we've had some very fiscally irresponsible years under Donald Trump. It's time to get our house in order. Hell no! You know what he did? He decided <laughs> he, he didn't spend enough we money. We didn't spend enough money. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna turn the money printers on 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 maximum overdrive yeah. and spend multi trillion dollars on more COVID bills. Well, and so, like I said, we're dealing with pathologically unserious people. If we know that in both parties, and and it's it's especially the case with the Democratic Party. It's it's it, they're basically executing their promises when they get into office, and then they spend trillions of dollars. Republicans are hypocrites, whereas Democrats yeah. are true believers on this. Yeah. And the the fact of the matter is, is that even though there are some good Republicans in D.C., there's people like Thomas Massey and Mike Lee and Rand Paul and stuff like that 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 are fighting the good fight. They're they're so massively outnumbered that. They're they're a minority within their own party. Well, and, and, well, think about think about what an absurd statement it has become politically. And I got hammered for this because I was sitting there explaining to a group once, and I said, "Well, Social Security operates very similarly to a Ponzi scheme. A Ponzi scheme is this whole idea that I'm paying I, I'm paying the current investors from money that is that is coming in from future investors, but it's not like I've invested in something that's productive, that's gaining in, in wealth and value over time. And then what I'm doing is I'm sharing profits associated with that valuable enterprise. That's not what's going on. Money is coming in, and then I'm giving you interest on your money, right? I'm 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 cooking the books essentially. 
Um, you're, you're still able to pull out money to some degree until it all collapses because it's not built on anything stable. Well, when I pointed out that, well, okay, if you look at the way that Social Security is run, right, it, this is not, it's not going into some sort of fund that is accruing interest over time because it's being used in all these productive profit-making endeavors. No, it's just the government has the ability to take money by force, and so it can continue to pay if it's taking money by force. The problem is, is what happens when you have fewer people to take money from and more people taking out? It, you reach insolvency. Yeah. By, by merely saying that that's a bad way to run it, would, would, did somebody come up and say, no, Nick, actually, fiscally, this makes a lot of sense to run it that way. No, they no. said you hate old people you, and you want grandma to die. You want, you, you, he called this system that millions of Americans depend on and paid into a Ponzi scheme. Like within the Republican party, yeah. there were political operatives when Nick was running for Congress that were like, well, Nick is completely unelectable. He's destroyed his chances of ever getting elected to anything because he said social security is a Ponzi scheme. And then my response is, is it, is it incorrect? And then their response is, is that going to change the political reality of how people are going to see it? We're both right in, in, to, to, to some yeah. degree. They're being cynical on it and saying, that's why we should never run people like Nick for office because we'll never lose. Well, I mean, by that logic, then we truly are doomed, yeah. right? Because well, if it is, if it is, political suicide to say something that is factually correct and truthful and not just factually correct and truthful like saying the sky is blue yeah that doesn't necessarily impact our day-to-day -day lives but factually correct and truthful insofar as this is a problem that is going to get larger and larger with each passing year and unless we do something about it it will eventually destroy the federal budget yeah and if the federal budget gets has a massive hole blown into it like it currently has and it's only growing eventually we've talked about this yeah. That hole must eventually only be filled with debt monetization. Yeah. And debt, when debt monetization kicks in permanently, I don't mean temporarily, but permanently, when that becomes a thing, it, it is literally only a matter of time until the entire system collapses. Fiat currency systems, historically, have a 100% track record of ending in failure. 100% track record. And by Sometimes fiat, and it by takes... Fiat, by fiat currency, what we're essentially talking about is that a government is able to simply print money with nothing, like some, no, sort, of no limitation. some sort of commodity, some sort of something, right, that, that is supposed to back it up and give it, that, that, is, that limits the government's ability to simply print out currency. Yes. And we don't, we don't have any of those limits. And Richard Nixon was the one that, that got rid of the final vestige of us, of the government not being able to just arbitrarily print as much as they want it. And, and it, it doesn't matter what era in history you look at. You can go to the Romans or the Byzantines or the Chinese with the Yuan. It, it, it does not matter. Fiat currency systems historically, sometimes they could take a century or so, but yeah. they always end in complete collapse. And uh, that, that will eventually happen in the U.S. dollar unless we revert back to, you know, the gold standard, which that's never going to happen. It's yeah. just never going to happen. I, I, as much as the Ron Paul people, you know, geek out about it, it's just that will not happen. Well, and, so and, we know. <laughs> I, Kelly Williams says the only the only metal I invest in is brass and lead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose that gets into the whole the whole prepping thing. So I, I think that fiscally there might be a few other things you want to bring up, but certainly on the fiscal front, it is looking unbelievably dire yeah well, over 30 trillion in debt which is which is all we we get to the point now where whenever the debt goes up by significant amounts people always act like one why does this matter because most of it's owned by you know americans oh don't you love two, that we just owe it to ourselves yeah to such a cop out yeah two it, it's this whole idea that um well we've we've been told that the debt was a horrible thing that was going to kill us for decades now right it's 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 they, they almost treat it like the right treats like these apocalyptic predictions about global warming, right? Like, oh, Florida is going to be underwater in 10 years. The ice caps will be gone. Polar bears will be extinct. And then it doesn't happen. And people are like, all right, you've just cried wolf too many times. We've seen a lot of that with respect to debt crisis. The issue is, is that there, there is a, it's always correct to be concerned about it because it can reach a, a certain level where, especially when your, your productivity is not doing as well as it should be, and, and it's not projected to do as well as it should, where you're, you're going to have a crisis of faith in money, a crisis of faith of institutions. And then the, the concern about this also is that every time this starts to happen, you get people like Elizabeth Warren, who has been a, a major source of the problem ever since she's been in office. And every time she advocates for a policy and it produces horrible results, 
She never comes back and says, oh, maybe, gosh, maybe this government central planning was, wasn't the best idea. No, no, no. It's always, we didn't have enough government central planning. We didn't have enough taxes. We didn't have enough. It's always, the solution is always give more power to Liz, right? That's always, so this is why, again, if you're taking more of the pessimistic look, there doesn't seem to be a lot of political will to be able to step up and say, look, if we're serious, if we're serious, we're going to have to make major changes because, quite frankly, we've been living off of a credit card. And, and you can't do that forever because at some point the bills do come yeah. do come home and you got to pay Nobody can run their household that way. Why yeah. would we let them run the government yeah. that way? So the, so the real question then is, okay, if, if, we, if we can agree that that's, that's pretty bad, right, then, okay, what do we want? Well, I mean, I, I'll be really upfront with what I want is that I look at a lot of these government programs that are being run right now and, and people always have this assumption that if you don't want these government programs, it's because you don't want anything to be done and because you're a mean, bad, horrible, no good person. And it's like, no, 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 I, I, I want health care. I want affordable housing. I, I, I want good education. I want all of these things. I just don't think the government's the best way to do it. And one of the reasons why I think that is because I've been watching. <laughs> I mean, look at it. Like, is it is it really that is it really that incredible or ridiculous to look at what's going on with our with respect to our schools, with respect to um, the government intervention in healthcare, with respect to you know wars we've been involved in that we shouldn't be, to be able to look at these people and say, I don't trust you to manage these things, and it's not just because you're bad managers; it's because the system you've chose to manage it has bad incentives. And so even if we got the smartest people and put them in charge, it wouldn't matter because the incentive structure within government is not to treat people like customers. It's to treat people like they're a burden. And that's what you see. That like You come in and you're paying for a service. You get treated like a customer. You come in and they have to provide you a service regardless of your ability to pay. You don't get treated that way. And somebody still has to pay. The difference is, is that now, like, we had this, this recent um, a, a state senator in Virginia, Scott Serville, gets on there and goes... The government wants to shift the burden of paying for college from the state onto hardworking families. Like, Scott, where did the state get the money? It got it from those same hardworking families. The difference is, is that if I'm a hardworking family and I want to send my kid to college, yes, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to do that burden or my kid's going to have to, you know, share that burden. Why? Because you're the one getting the service. And what you're saying is, no, 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 wouldn't it be better if the government came into that hardworking family, confiscated your money, and then gave it to someone going to college whether or not your kid went or not? Like, no, that's not, in no universe is that a better system. In no universe is that a better incentive structure. But it's the one they want. And again, there doesn't seem to be a lot of politi political will. So it's not that we don't want healthcare, education, any of this stuff. We just think the private sector, and, and all the private sector is, is free people working in cooperation with one another. That's it. That's it. That's the free market is free people with property rights being able to engage in the transaction of goods and services with other people through voluntary cooperation. That's the big evil boogeyman but they, but they that, don't they, think that, that they are can, demonizing. They don't think they can trust average everyday people with making their own decisions and being successful in doing so. If, if anybody fails, that means that government needs to get involved. The trust thing is, is I, I, I find that interesting that you use the word trust because trust works in both directions. And this actually, I think, is kind of gets to, I think that there's a second point to like why the situation is as bad as it is and is probably only going to get worse rather than better from here on out. Um, not, not, not that I, I, not even I, the resident doomer think it will permanently get worse forever, yeah. but we are about to go through a, a very difficult cycle. And I think part of it is because of the trust component. There is the American people have completely lost trust in all of the public and private institutions that prop up this country, right? Like you, you can go through polling everything other than basically the military. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no trust in it. There's no trust in Certainly in, in, in Congress, there's no trust in the White House. There's absolutely no trust within Hollywood, academia, the media, corporate America, the, the federal administrative agencies, the, yep. the, the red tape of bureaucracy that's tied to the federal government as well. Um, there's, there's very little trust within state government as well and all those institutions that are tied to it. There's, there's even lower trust with police. Like, like, like every single institution that you can possibly think of that's either tied to government or tied to major sectors of the economy and society, 
what happens when you have, I mean, I, I said this in a previous podcast that like the left has actively tried to tear down most of these institutions because they think they're all built around systemic racism and oppressive yeah. power structures. And the right has given up defending them because they think the left has co-opted them. Yeah. And so what happens when the conservative forces of society that historically are supposed to be the bulwarks in favor of defending mm -hmm. these, these institutions that create civil society, when they abandon those institutions because they don't think they're worth defending? Well, okay, but here's, here's that part gets into the whole right-wing backlash the, that we did on Thursday. Yeah, but here's part of the problem I have with that. I, I get it, and I don't, I don't disagree, but I would say that, again, one of the things that the problems that we're having is that there's this, oh, there's this emphasis on the government program, as if all of the government programs would run efficiently if we just put conservatives in charge of them. And and that's part better of the, conductors of the train wreck. Yeah, better conductors of the train wreck. And and I don't want better conductors of the train wreck. I, I want there to be some appreciation, renewed appreciation, and I think a lot of people do have this, of this idea that the, the again, the reason why free people doing it in 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 the private sector and voluntary transactions tends to work better, right? Not perfect. Not everything is perfect. It tends to work better than a bunch of government central planners no, running I, the I show. Running the show is because the incentive structures are correct, and it doesn't mean you don't provide help and assistance to one another in need. The big difference is, is that if you really want a strong community, you 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 actually get that a lot more when people are voluntarily choosing to step up and help their neighbor because not only do one. People are now investing in, in a in a sort of community and society where they're going to be helped in turn when they need it, but they're also creating an environment where the person receiving the help doesn't feel entitled to it. They don't feel that they're they're just getting their fair and just payment based off of you know, I, I don't know sins of the previous you know century or anything like. It's nothing like that. It's like I now know the person that's giving me money. I know they had to work for it. I know they had to do something, and they are now giving it to me voluntarily because. They understand that I'm in need right now. And that builds a sense of, of trust in, in, in systems and communities and traditions, which is far more valuable than handing these over to a bunch of politicians that have every incentive. And listen to me on this one. They have every incentive to hide the true costs of their programs and the way that they deliver them. And so, again, it's those sort of perverse incentives that create this situation. But they can be replaced with other systems, but not systems controlled by the government. It there, just There's a question. Nick, there, there's a question real quick. John Mumbley says, uh, who does Nick think he could immediately work with to address these issues? I'm not sure exactly what he means by that, whether it's people who maybe see it the same way as mm -hmm. you, and maybe we could work toward a government solution, which typically would be like less government well, for us. I, I, yeah, <laughs> a government I, solution to us is less government. The, the government solution is, is get the government out of a lot of this. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, I have people in the general assembly that I, I work with people like, you know, Mike Weber and Amanda Batten and, and Phil Scott. And, you know, I, I mean, there's, and there's other people too, where I, I work with these people and, and we have a similar worldview with respect to trying to get the government away from doing things that the government is not designed to do. I gave this example once before. This is a little bit like your, this is a little bit like your car breaking down and you going to your dentist and insisting that he fix it. And then when he fails to fix it, you're like, well, that dentist sucks. He clearly doesn't care about me or the fact that I need my car. It's like, well, no, it's just that that's not the dentist's skill set. That's You went to the wrong office. You went to the wrong person for what you need done. And so if, if we go back to what do we want, right? So like we, we've already established why we think things are going in this particular direction and why there isn't a great deal of political incentive to, to change it. If, if what you want is a freer society with, with you know, prosperity and you still have mechanisms through families and churches and community and civic organizations, which can actually help the poor and the people that are in need, you can do all those things still, right? Nothing, nothing there. If you want that, we're going to actually have to get back to building it. And we used to be able to do it easier because there weren't as many government regulations. There weren't as many taxes. There wasn't a much government confiscation or intervention. And now we have all of those things. That, that prevents or makes it more difficult to provide the other stuff that we want, I would argue we have to do it anyway. We have to do it in spite of that because the only way that you're going to get people to, again, let go of the lie is that you have to actually point to the truth that works. And one of the big things we want to talk about today and that we want the audience helping us out with is what are some of the ways that we do that? And We've talked a lot about, you know, entrepreneurialism. We've talked about homesteading. We've talked about homeschooling. 
And I think all of those things are, are things that typically you can do. You don't got to wait for a politician to pass a bill. You don't got to wait. You can just go do them. Now, there's, there's red tape. There's bureaucracy. Sometimes you have to work through, obviously, if you're running a business or things like that. But a lot of this is stuff that you can just, you can start to do. You can proactively do. And we started, we started talking. And by we, I mean, I, I kind of forced everybody into this. We said, all right, well, okay, we've got the summer coming up. Summer's a good opportunity to, to try things, to do things, to, do you, you know, resolve to do things or whatever. So like over a 90-day period, over a 90-day period, you know, we'll call it June, July, August. And for those of you who are like, the summer starts, I don't care, June, July, August. That's what we're calling it. All right. What are various things that you can do without asking permission that you can just do that are going to make you stronger, you more capable, you more effective into building the sort of society that you want that aren't political? I think the can, first thing, I think the first thing in building a society that you want is the word society. You cannot isolate in your own house and not go out and <laughs> do, do you feel personally attacked? I feel right personally now, Christian? attacked. So I need I, I demand to be validated now. Okay. Um, but, I, I'm not just speaking to Christian. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm Oh, saying, she's speaking like, to Hamilton too. No, I have a tendency to want to I tend to be an introvert. A lot of people don't realize that, but that's what I am. And so I love just kind of isolating and and being in my own little you know world or whatever but the problem with that is that we are social beings and we really do need that and the more you isolate the more you want to isolate and the more you dislike people and you can't live like that we we need other people and so you have to be willing to go and invest in other people's lives and one of the one of the things I always point out is, you know, when you go to like, let's say you go to a new church or you're trying mm -hmm. to find a church that you feel comfortable at, that, that you feel, um, a part of, well, everyone complains. And, and this is like universal. Everyone complains that they don't, they don't feel welcomed or they don't feel like they're really part of this church. And every single time you look back and you ask, do you serve? Mm -hmm. What do you mean serve? Well, are you somebody that goes to a church and you are just a consumer of church? Yeah, yeah. Or do you also serve in the church? You will never feel like you're part of the church. You will never feel welcomed until you are serving and you are working side by side with other people within that church, getting to know them and getting to know each other's lives and, and, and who we are. You can't just feel welcomed by going every Sunday and consuming the worship and consuming the um, teaching and the teaching, taking your kids to the, the little kid area and just consuming the services. You're consuming the services of other volunteer people who have volunteered their time and effort and energy. And you're not. OK, Liz, you're not volunteering it back. I'm not <laughs> offering a government solution. No, no. But I'm uh, offering a I, personal solution on how to feel like you're more of a part of a community. Well, no, and no, no, no. I the, would the, always start at the church community. The, but the, the joke was me. more. The joke was more like it reminded me, and, and I'm being I'm being mean on you. I'm about to tear down my own argument here, but um, but the, the 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 joke that I was trying to make reminded me of when Liz was like, "Well, you drove your products to market on the roads. The rest of us, well, no, paid, but, but built." But the, or, but the, I get that, but the big difference the big difference here. But and, we're and talking non government solutions, yeah, and, she, and you're bringing us back to government solutions. See, once Way again, to go! Gosh, no, no, I'm saying that the logic that you're using okay, is Boomer. similar to the logic that that Elizabeth Warren used, but it isn't at all because it's this not, is all because voluntary. Because I'm talking about voluntary. This is all voluntary. Well, I did the, the, say I was about to tear down my own yeah. argument. <laughs> well, here's here's the but here's Here's the point, though, getting to like, OK, so one of the categories that so here's the categories that we're looking at. We're looking at intellectual, spiritual, physical, uh, relational, and then uh, developing capabilities and experiences. Right. So these are like the categories that we're going over, like, OK, for the next for this for this summer, the people at this table and hopefully people in the audience at well are going to look at these various categories and go, what are things in these in these categories that I can do over the next 90 days that actually contribute again, non-political that actually contribute to creating the sort of society that I want, right? Because I, ideally we're thinking the society we want is a good thing. So then what do we do in order to create it? So Tina's point, which I think I, I have, I have seen this, I have experienced this is that when, when you look at, there's this thing called intentional communities, right? That's this new term that's going around. Dr. Robert Malone talked about it. Other people have talked about it. It's these intentional communities where you're, you're a part of something that's bigger than yourself 
and it provides a variety of, of support system, essentially. It provides ability for to cooperate, to collaborate in order yeah. to achieve things. A, a church is one of those intentional communities if you treat it that way. But if you just treat church as a building that you go to on Sundays to and you consume stuff and that's it, and maybe maybe you tithe, maybe, right? I, I'm sorry, you, you're not actually... You're not actually being a part of something. You're just, you're, you're going to the movies, right? Yeah, you're going to be entertained. Uh, and what I mean by this is uh, the beauty of this, and this is why this is a voluntary thing, is you're going to come across people that just rub you the wrong way. And you're going to you're gonna come across people that you just simply don't click with. We're not going to be, we can be civil, we can be fine. I can like you just fine, but we're really not going to be great friends because we just aren't each other's type of people. And that's totally okay. And you can go ahead and nurture the relationships that you feel like you click with these people. And you can kind of keep at arm's length the ones where you don't you don't click. And that's the beauty of this being voluntary, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, my big thing is find your people. Find people you click with. Find people you feel safe with. We all need some, some people. You, you don't necessarily need a huge group of people, yeah. but you need a few people that are, you can confide in that like if the stuff hit the fan, they'd come and help you yeah. or you could help them. I mean, we have friends and, and folks nearby that when the eggs got super expensive, yeah. we were able to provide some eggs yeah. because we had those. And in other situations, they provide out other things. We, we had a situation where our mower broke down for a little while. I had to take it in. And we had some friends that brought over their mower each week for me and let me mow. And then they'd come and pick it back up. It was amazing. And it's like you've, you've got to have people where, you know, You've got this thing, I've got this other thing, and you voluntarily can exchange it. You kind of have your own capitalist society within your own group of, of friends and group of people that, that you care about. So that's that's number one. Number one is find find your people. Yeah. Right. Find number your one, kind of like step one on what we're talking about is find your people. That could be church, I, it could be a civic organization, it could be something else. But find your people and don't find those people just with the intention of getting something out of it, but yeah. also contributing to it. Quick, quick question to Tina. Um, you said kind of having our own capitalist society. I think that's really interesting. But what what is the currency we exchange in that situation Goods if it's not and money? services? Is that it? Your value Bitcoin. is what you bring to the table. Bitcoin. No. Okay. Well, I mean, Bitcoin has zero value in well, a situation we, like that. Where because here's the deal. Um, you might. Let's say you've got some incredible video and editing capabilities and some yeah. sound experience and things like that. And let's say I've got an event that I really need somebody to help me with that. Yeah. You could help me with that. And in return, I could help you with something that I'm good at, well, you know? The, the point I was making there about, you know, it's your, like basically trade. It's like barter yeah. and trade like they used to have. Well, the currency doesn't always have to be financial. No. It can be goodwill. It could be service to other people. That's the point I was trying to make. Yeah, that. it could be helping somebody well, move. Could, one, it one could be the, letting them borrow your truck because you have a truck and they don't have a truck. You one, know? One, of, one of the things that's really interesting about the way that we look at wealth, right? Wealth is generally associated with the, the amount of units of currency you control. But those units of currency only signify wealth insofar as they can buy the things that you actually want. It's the goods and the services which are the wealth Currency is just a is a mechanism which facilitates the transaction. That that's it. And so what we're talking about here is that there's ways to actually de develop wealth or things of value that is not necessarily tied to currency. It it, it has worth. Um, so find your people, right? That's yeah. for the next ninety days. If you don't got people, find find your people. Yeah, and increase <laughs> your value. Yeah. So if well, you're not somebody that has any skills or value um, beyond what you can go and do for a paycheck. You might want to work on well becoming more well rounded so that you can bring value to the table when you do find that group of friends. So let's let's start with this because there's there's and we're going to start with the intellectual category, right? Intellectual category. What are ways that you can make yourself more intellectually formidable? Yeah, and that can be that can be valuable for you, you know you know future capabilities that you want to yeah. develop. It can be valuable for if you're going to interact with people. Having the ability to effectively interact with them, especially on topics, is one of the ways you find your people mm -hmm. is when you engage in the sort of intellectual pursuits that interest you, and then you find other people that also enjoy yeah. those intellectual pursuits. That's part of finding your people. So I'm going to ask everybody at the table, and anybody in the audience too can do this as well, give, give me one book, one book 
that you have to, like have to be done reading at the end of the summer. Have to be done reading at the end of the summer. You have to have like picked it up and read it. What's one book, Christian? What's your book? One book. You're starting with me. One book. Go ahead. Uh, I was about to say, you know, I really hope the apocalypse doesn't like kick off this summer because I I'm busy this summer writing this. <laughs> I'm writing a dissertation, man. I I, All right, I don't, don't give us one of your books from a dissertation. What's your book? Oh man, I was about What's to tell book? you. You know, uh, Austro-Hungarian naval policy from oh 1868 gosh. to 1918. I can't imagine why you're still single. That's <laughs> that's what my dissertation's on. But like, I, I, actually, it's to 1913. But like, I I just. Do you want us to get back to you? Because I'm gonna take. I'm gonna probably gonna take your book if you let me go first. I, I, yes, I get it. You're gonna say the the law, but I am. <laughs> like I, actually, a, a a book that would very. It's it's. It's not for the faint of heart because it's it's somewhat difficult to get through. But if you can get through it, it carries a lot of value, especially insofar as our previous episode on why the dollar will inevitably collapse, as well as our episode in some ways on the um, the coming right wing backlash. You're really selling this right now. It's 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 called the road to serfdom. Oh, by yeah. F. A. Hayek. Hayek. Hay- Hayek hypothesized basically that you know post World War II that you know the West is going to try to um, establish a, a, a democratic socialist society yeah. using gimmicks within fiscal and monetary policy in order to achieve uh, basically a utopia here on earth and that it's going to inevitably fail. And not only is it going to inevitably fail, it's going to, it's going to squash individual action and incentive. Well, I think that the valuable thing Hang that- on and replace it with a, a more totalitarian system. Now, the thing that Hayek postulated was basically that this would be like like a, a soft form of despotism on the left, but he was writing this also during World War II when you know it was it was supposedly right wing fascist countries like Germany and Italy that that were trying to conquer Europe. So I think that if Hayek was here today, he would argue that there there is if we're going down the path that we're going down it will lead into some form of dictatorship whether or not it identifies as being on the left or right is irrelevant the fact I, is, is i think that, i think it's a good book choice for yeah, the yeah, day that yeah. we live in right now i think it's a good book choice too and i think that christian would be happy to actually read the book for us right now if we let him read but it to everybody. road to the, the okay explain here's it. what here's what i also think is the, the big value to road to serfdom is that he does an excellent job of explaining cause and effect on how you start off in one area that sounds good and sounds nice, or or at least sounds benign, and then end up with serfdom. And it's so, like, all right, socialism so starts with extravagant promises of yeah. utopia, and it ends with you eating your cat. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so that's Christian's book recommendation: is the road to serfdom. Tina. Okay, you guys, this is a very short book, and it is inside of another what people would call a book, but <laughs> the book of uh, Philippians. Oh, all right. Oh, yeah. It is very short. You could read it. You could sit down and read it very quickly. But I feel like in the current day that we're in right now, there is wisdom in there and ways to deal with and handle things that I think everyone would find incredibly valuable. Um, One of my favorite verses within it is uh, talks about basically setting your mind on things that are not all of these negative things. You, what you do is you force yourself to look at, um, what is good, what is noble, what, if there's anything good, think about those things. And it it basically helps you to reorient your mind because it gets really, really easy to focus on the negative and focus on what's going wrong in society and what's going wrong around you and in your relationships and, and, what you're doing wrong or what your kids are doing wrong. And it gets you to look at things a little bit differently and start trying to find in those situations and around you, whatever could be good. Like what is something good I can name or, or feel out, you know? And so honestly, I feel like it's, it's always been one of my favorite, favorite books for that reason. And, and basically making sure that your reasonableness, like you're the reasonable mind and you're able to stop be, stop the negative and look at the positive. And I know that that's a really, really uh, basic way to look at it, but, but that's the way I see it. I, f- I feel like it's, um, it's, a, it's a way to reorient. All right. Tina went with Philippians, the number one bestseller of all time. 
Hamilton, what's your book? <laughs> My book recommendation is The Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. Uh, I have to admit, I have not finished the book yet, but I absolutely intend to. And the premise behind the book is that we all believe that we are rational thinkers and that we sh really should examine how deep our rationality goes and if we are getting our emotions tied up in conclusions that we come to. Um, and it, it a lot of it surrounds like anyone who's interested in why people do the things that they do. Yeah, this is a good book. You for said that. Robert Greene. Robert didn't Green. he also write the Forty Eight Laws of Power? He he might have. I think he did. That was I'll tell you what that was a dark book. Really? Yes, it was a and dark it's book. A very dark book. You know, because he, he he explains he explains a lot. And one of the things he tried to preface it when he talks about this is he goes, "I'm not I'm not giving like a moral one way or another. I'm just telling you these are these are ways that people have attained power." But so that's not the book, Robert. He's you want Robert Green, the laws of human nature. Yep. All right. I okay. So I've thought about this one, and and I I think I'm just going to stick with I think I'm going to stick with the classic. There's a couple others I really thought of, like Life at the Bottom by Theodore Dalrymple. I think is one of the it is one of the better books I've read in a long time. Anything by Thomas Sowell. Yes. Anything by Thomas Sowell uh, is incredible. Um, but the the primer, like the book I feel like you need to start with on kind of like this political philosophy stuff, is The Law by Frederick Bastiat. It's like 70 pages. And the guy does such a good job of laying out both the cause for or, or the case for liberty at the same time that he explains the problem with the, the government taking too much control of society. And, and he just decimates some of the arguments. And, and again, this guy wrote this at the, this guy wrote this right around the French revolution um, a, as a member of the French, you know, parliament. He did not write this around the French revolution. The one that people think of, he wrote this around the French revolution of 1848. Yeah. Yeah. Not eight, not, not seventeen eighty. Sorry. Sorry. I should have. Yeah. I should have. Sorry, thank you for the correction. Yeah, I'm not talking about the French have had three republics since, right? <laughs> right? So they they've been like, but but he 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 wrote this, um, you know, a, a, around that time, and it was it, again just a fascinating um, kind of expose of you know political philosophy and and you know again what what government should be doing, what it shouldn't be doing. He t he talks a lot about plunder. The difference between plunder and trade right. and, and these things are, are really, really important concepts to what, understand. What do you think is the most popular misconception in people's minds that that book addresses and helps fix? Um, oh, gosh. I, I think it's it's probably when, – when we talk a lot about the nature of voluntary transactions versus the, the use of force, the way Bastiat describes this that I, I think is very, very powerful – is is he talks about the concept of legalized plunder? Okay, that that once you have created a society where where you are allowing for plunder to take place with it, that basically people will seek out that power and they'll create legal codes to allow it and a moral mm. code to justify it. Wow! And that over time, what ends up happening is that more and more of your society gets consumed by this grasp for political power yeah. in order to get what you want. And it's always at the expense of somebody else. So he has this famous quote where he goes, you know, everybody wants to live at the expense of the state. They forget that the state wants to live at the expense of everybody. Mm. And so it, it's these, he, so he doesn't just get into kind of practically why it doesn't work. He also does a very good job of explaining the moral deficiency of it. Yeah. The moral deficiency of all of these things that sound so nice, but then when you look at what it takes to execute them, you realize that, like I always tell people, my number one, my number one complaint with socialism is not that it fails to work economically. It's that it's inherently immoral. Mm -hmm. It is inherently immoral. It is evil because it is entirely reliant. Now, you can make an argument for voluntary socialism, right? Yeah. Voluntary socialism. If you want to go live in a, in a commune, no problem. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this sort of thing which essentially says that every single aspect of our existence is going to be built on the use of coercive force in order to get what we want. That that's problematic. So the law by Boston. All right, that's the that's the books. Um, all right, we got to go ahead. Did we get Christians? Yeah, Christian okay. said the road to serfdom. Cool, cool. Sorry. All right, so we got the road to serfdom. Philippians, the law of human nature by Green, and the law by Bastiat. If you read one of those books over the summer, please tell us in the please, circle. Please community. tell us. Please tell us a list. So that that'll be one of your that'll be one of the intellectual things that you can do over the summer. In order to make yourself can, Nick, more can formidable. I, can I propose a question here that yeah. I think might be helpful? Um, you know, over the last three years or so, I've really dived into the world of business, content, social media, uh, building a business around that. 
Um, but I, you know, typically in the past, I had invested much more in the intellectual philosophy, political. Like, how would you recommend me jump back into the intellectual, political philosophy right now um, to start expanding my knowledge in that area? Obviously, the law would be a good book to read, but is there any other strategy I should be thinking about? Well, I mean, I, I think you, I think, so one of the things I- You I can have, listen to this podcast. Yeah, <laughs> I, I enjoy, I mean, I, I enjoy reading books. I think a lot of people more and more feel like they have less and less time for it. So there's certain podcasts. One of the things that is, is nice about the book is that obviously you can sit there, pick it up, put it down whenever yeah. you want. But I also think it's it's uh, very both educational and entertaining to actually listen to the authors explain and elaborate um, and expound on what they what they okay. wrote because once they wrote it, it's that it's there and that's it. Right. But when you actually see someone going through the interview and getting to ask questions of the author, what did you mean by this? What did you mean by that? There's a there's a great show called um, Uncommon Knowledge. Oh yes, I like Uncommon that. Uncommon Knowledge done by the Hoover Institute. And Peter Robinson, I think, is a, is very good at interviewing people. And interviewing is a interviewing is a skill. I've tried to interview people. I'm not very good at it. I've gotten a little bit better, but it's it's tough. It's not something you just sit down and do. Peter Robinson does a good job. I would start off, go on Uncommon Knowledge, and just look at some of the interviews he does with Thomas Sowell. Because Thomas Sowell is kind of a smart aleck. He, he's he's just he's really entertaining to listen to. Um you know, got like his voice is soothing. Like the guy is just, I fanboy about Thomas Sowell a lot, but I would say find if you have certain thinkers that you like read their books, but also look for the opportunities where they've actually provided lectures or debates um, or things like that. And, and watch that interaction that they have with people, because I think you actually learn, um, you know, in addition to whatever they write or, or say. It's great advice. All right. So let's go on to uh, the one, right? Let's go on to uh, physical. Physical. So what are what are some of the physical things that you can do over the next 90 days? And I'm, I'm going to start off with that one. Go to the gym and purposefully don't just like go up and like random. Like, oh, I'm going to try this weight machine. Don't do that. Come up with a plan for what you're going to do and go to the gym at least three times a week. Okay. Don't got to work out for more than like an, 45 minutes to an hour is usually plenty, right? Usually plenty. But go to the gym three times a week in order to build up your physical strength. Could be a CrossFit gym, do but and and do a combination, men or women, do a combination of both cardio, which I hate, agreed, and weightlifting. Because it, it's amazing how like bone density and things like that, if you're if you think you're at an age where like oh, I'm just not gonna lift weights anymore, or a lot of women will be like, oh, I'm just not gonna lift I'm telling you, do do both of those yeah. things three times a week, no more than like 45 minutes to an hour in the gym. Yeah, because osteoporosis and things like that in women after a certain age is a really big problem. And people sort of ignore the science behind strengthening your muscles, also strengthening your bones. Yeah. So. All right. So that's my that's my physical uh, that's my physical recommendation. Are you, are you asking us to commit to that? I, I well, I mean, all of this is stuff that like, you know, commit to something along this. So what would be your recommendation? It could be a sport. It could be hiking. It could be whatever, something physical. Um, listen, I'm just gonna have to commit to your challenge and run with that. All righty, <laughs> all righty, Tina, you got one? Not really, not really. <laughs> Don't even think about asking me this question. <laughs> well, okay, physical is not just working out or things. Okay, it I could saw also one be of these comments. I actually, I'm just gonna read it because it's so funny. It's 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 very insulting directed towards me, but it's actually really funny. Um. Uh. This this one guy in the comments said, Is it war "Wandering warrior." Yes. <laughs> he, he said, "He just wants you to go to the gym, Christian." He he said something. I I don't I I can't find it off the top of my head. But um, it, it was it was when I I brought up earlier, like you know, can the apocalypse wait a a year because <laughs> you know I'm I'm busy working on my dissertation, and he was basically like, "How is that gonna help you in a you know." <laughs> <laughs> end of end of civilization scenario. You need to get to the gym, bulk up, and and cultivate some blue collar get skills. Oh, man. I will say this: I do think there's this element of of society within within both the left and right that is very anti philosophical, and it's almost like anti intellectual. And honestly, I, I I totally despise that. Well, and there's this, like, also meathead movement that's like, oh, philosophy is just common sense with big uh, words. There's this or, philosophical movement that literally just wants to stay in philosophy and do nothing else. <laughs> yeah, and and well, wait, wait, wait. So that's the point. Before we go down this like 
rabbit trail. That's the <laughs> point, right? Is that there's a reason there's why two we sides of a coin. We started off with the intellectual component here. We actually spent a lot of time talking about deep, heady, philosophical things on this program because we think that's important. What I'm saying is that the physical is also important. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote John Lovell from Warrior Poet Society. Um, he did a great job. I was actually listening to him speak at a homesteaders convention, and he was talking about how to defend your property. Yeah. And it was a really interesting conversation. It was like, how do you defend your property, right? You never know what's going to happen. Quite frankly, if you're living if you're living in certain parts of this country, having to physically defend your property might be a, a real thing that you have to do. And so he was going through, and one of the things he was saying was, stay in shape, like go, like work out. He goes, and there's a couple of reasons why you want to do this. He goes, first of all, if you ever find yourself in a physical altercation, it's probably a good idea to, to you know, not be slow and weak, <laughs> like, Oh, that's fair enough. Secondly, he goes, stay in shape. He goes, because it actually affects how much you consume with respect to things like junk food, because the physical is not just working out. It's also, what are you eating? Well, like, if you're are, in are a survival you, are situation, you, yeah. are you consuming way more food than other people are consuming? Yeah. He brought that out. He's like, he goes, are, are you, he goes, if you are in good, if you are in good physical shape, you can work harder and consume less. He goes, because bottom line in a survival situation, survival situations become weight loss programs real quick. Right? Yeah. Uh, and the that and living in a socialist country <laughs> is a weight loss program. If there's, yes, yeah, Karl Marx designed the best weight Go loss on the program Cuban diet ever. Yeah. Or the North Korean diet. He goes, so that's the second reason. And he goes, the third reason, he said this on stage and I about lost it. It was so funny. He goes, you're just more fun to procreate with if you're, <laughs> you know what? That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I got. I have a recommendation. I'm okay. gonna sound like a total lib, maybe even a hippie. Okay, um, but there, you know, we're, we all watch Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts. Andrew Huberman has some great advice, and one of the things that he recommended was: as soon as you wake up, get out of bed, go outside, get some sun. And mm. this has been a really, really good for me because typically in the afternoon I start to get tired about five o'clock. I lose motivation. Um, but for probably the last month or so, the first thing that I do after getting out of bed, hit, hit go on the coffee pot, go outside, walk around for a little bit, get the sun, and I don't get as tired in the afternoon. I feel like my day gets a better start. And I know that's not like fitness, but I think this has been really beneficial for me. And yes, you need to touch some grass in the process. All right. So we've got go to the gym. That's three a nice times. way to say pull weeds. We got, <laughs> so we got go to the gym three times a week or just get up and walk outside briefly. <laughs> Thank you, Hamilton. That's quite the commitment. <laughs> it's not as hard as going to the gym. No, it, but it, no, it, it, there, there, is, there is something about getting Some outside. Some people live too far away from the gym. So what is an alternative? <laughs> well, wandering, war, wandering Warrior mentioned something that I think is interesting. He talked about put on a rucksack or a backpack or whatever it is and, and hike. Right. R like rucking is important because and I think he, I think he worded is like if you can't carry your stuff, you're prey. Here's what I find really interesting about um, some of the most elite military units you will you will go to. Right. Um, CAG or what's kind of more commonly known as Delta Force. And uh, special forces, Army Special Forces. Do you know what's one of the primary ways that they weed people out early on in selection? It's land navigation and usually with, with a heavy ruck. So what that means is like if this is an individual individual exercise. You have to go out there. Usually, you know, 50, 60 could be more pound rucksack, right? So you, that's what you're carrying on your back plus all, all your other equipment. And you have your map and you have points that you're supposed to get to. You're not allowed to use roads. You can use them for like um, you can like find a road on the map to kind of orient yourself to where you're at, but you can't use the roads, right? And you've got to make it from one point to another point by yourself carrying weight. And that is how, like, if you can't make it through that portion, you won't go to the rest of Special Forces Qualification Course. You won't go to the, to the Operators Training Course. You won't do any of that. So it's, it's interesting that one of the primary ways the most, some of the most elite military units in the world identify whether or not someone can even participate in the rest of training is can you carry your weight and can you get from point A to point B with a map? And... So I, I, would, I think there's something too. So if you can't get out, you can't go to the gym or whatnot, 
going out and learning how to, uh, or like hiking or whatnot, finding a place to go. I mean, here in Virginia, we have the Shenandoah, you know, we have the Blue Ridge Mountains, we have the Shenandoah National Park. There's all kinds of places to hike, but actually like carrying weight with you when you do it. Not, not just going out and, and pleasurely strolling, but actually throwing some weight on there, building it up over time. And being able to do that is a really, really good, it's a very good physical fitness activity. It's also a very, very practical activity. All right, so that so for that we got we got go ruck march. <laughs> There's other people too that like I, I have some fans that are like really big fans of CrossFit. I, I never got into it, but it was really popular in the military for a while. In fact, a good friend of mine, good friend of mine that I served on an ODA with, um, went to Iraq with, went to Bangladesh with. Um, he ended up he ended up dying in Afghanistan, getting killed in Afghanistan. Um, he used to love CrossFit. And, and the interesting thing about it is there's some, there's some crazy workouts out there, but there's also actually a lot of workouts that are, I, I would say, provide a lot of practical strength in ways that just going to the gym and like bench press may be a cool number to read off if you've got a high bench press. It's not all that valuable overall compared to a lot of the other ways that you can actually develop your strength. All right. There are some zombies pretty far. <laughs> If you're getting that close to the zombies, man, you're in trouble. Maybe we'll do that as a special thing at the end. We'll all talk about what our plan is for this. Yeah. Now, if the apocalypse goes straight zombie, what's your plan for that? I've actually thought about this. Anyway, <laughs> all right, so we got the physical. Gym three times a week. Go out to sign as soon as you get up and get some sun. Kind of kickstart your day appropriately. Ruck march, hiking, things like that. The other thing I would say, too, is, is like with, with eating, one of the things, and, and look, I like bourbon. I do. I like bourbon. I am really trying to just cut down my overall alcohol consumption because more and more, every study that now comes out saying that it does a lot to deteriorating your your intellect, your physical. Like for men, your testosterone levels go down significantly. Um, if you, the more you drink, it it leads to some really bad. Yeah. My my dad ended up in the hospital actually when I was in college um, because he liked liquor in the same way that Nick did. Not that he was like an alcoholic. He wasn't yeah. an alcoholic, but <laughs> not like Nick. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I meant it for both of you, but yeah. like, um, yeah, he ended up in the hospital, um, because liquor is. Li he 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 told me afterwards he was like liquor is poison. Yeah, and and he didn't realize it until you know I guess his forties, late forties or something like that. That you know li liquor is poison, and yeah. um, it it also it also helps that uh. Certain companies whose names we will not be saying, or at least I will not be saying, um, have, have actively sided with the Wokies on this issue, who are also purveyors of alcohol. Yeah. Um, in fact, a couple of them. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I, I, I lied. I will say them. Bud Light. Yeah. And Jack Daniels. Go boycott yeah. them. Yeah. Um, Jack Daniels used to be like my favorite. Burn. That was my go-to whiskey. I, that was my go-to whiskey. And they they did some sort of like drag show I'll, thing. I'll, like, I'll end it I'm with done. this. I I. I, I do not actually I, I perfectly understand but part of me does not understand at all why a a a liquor company <laughs> would decide oh yeah the thing that our customers just are really craving for is drag queens well like white claw maybe but <laughs> like I, I I'll just leave it there I actually do know why they did it and it yeah. has nothing to do with increasing all right. sales Wait, but here's another thing too that would be interesting and that is um when it comes to when it comes to like your diet and stuff like that eat more meat Everything the FDA told you about that stupid flipping food pyramid is garbage. It is absolute garbage. So eat more meat. And and also like do a better job of actually figuring out where it actually where it comes from. One of yeah. the things that we, we're raising meat chickens for the first time this year, um, in part because we eat a ton of chicken. Um, we're raising our own pigs again. This is the second time we've done it. Mm -hmm. um, I want to. I want to get to doing my own beef. In the in the meantime, like Good Ranchers actually has a really good product. Oh yeah, because they have they have meat, they have chicken, they actually have seafood as well. But um, yeah, when we when I ordered their we, we ordered their stuff. I was like, all right, I'm gonna. Like, I was super skeptical. It was actually really, really good quality stuff. Well, trying to get away get away from processed foods, like. Yeah. Um, the other day I was telling Nick, gosh, can you stop buying this one cheese? And he goes, oh, don't worry. I'm done buying that. I will never cheese. buy shredded cheese again. I will never buy shredded cheese again. I like getting cheese in a block and shredding it myself because it's just so much better and it doesn't have that weird powdery substance on it. I saw I saw this reel where the guy was actually doing a comparison and talking about the stuff that they put in the cheese to mean keep it shredded in the bag. And it, it like it tastes horrible. It's horrible for you. It's got, like I will never buy shredded cheese again. All right. So eat more meat. All right. So there we go. All right. We got gym three times a week. Go outside as soon as you get up and get sun. Ruck march or hike. Cut down on your alcohol consumption. All right. And eat more meat. 
Sounds like a good plan. I think I, I'm, I'm going to commit to almost all of those. I don't think I'm going to go outside and, and hit the grass as soon as, well, I don't know. I might. I go just, out there. Just try you it go for outside a day. all the time. Honey, yeah. you love outside being outside. I love and being he's outside. always like planting things and yeah. shoveling things and ripping up shoveling weeds. I mean, if you're watching this show on YouTube, chances are that the reason you're doing so is because you've seen his shorts. And most of Nick's shorts are him outside. Yeah. Hey. That's so. true. All right. And then that cues everybody in the comments to make jokes about Nick Shorts. <laughs> it's what they did last time. Yeah. No, I, I no, somebody somebody commented when they watched the show for the first time, like, I'm here or I got here through Nick Shorts. And he goes, Wait, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> Man, you and I have totally we think of totally different things when the word shorts come up. You know what I think of? What? I think of Michael Burry. Oh, you're talking stocks. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, here we go to the next one. This one's gonna be fun. I think we're gonna be on this one a little while. I want Recommendations from the audience, capabilities and yeah. skill sets. So, what is what is a capability or skill set you are going to develop in the next ninety days? This could be as simple as if, if somebody knows how to do something that you've always wanted to learn how to do. It could be going and finding a YouTube video, and and like, but you are going to commit. I don't know how to do this, and in ninety days. I will, I will be able to do it, I, and I will have something to show for my efforts. 90, all right, so what is... This, I feel like we should have one of those nailed it episodes where it's like, here's my 90-day thing, <laughs> and nailed it, you know, and we can show our hunting. failures. It would be hilarious to show, like, where it went wrong and how we fixed it. Bastiat says hunting. That's a, that is a really good... If, now, hunting, you're, you're a little bit limited by seasons obviously on this if we're talking about the next 90 days there's some things you can't hunt some things you can't but I, I would say hunting or fishing like le legitimately le learning how to like effectively fish those are those are good skill sets we'll put those on the Bastiat says hunting what about okay never mind I'm writing this down too we're gonna keep track of this all right what's another what's the skill set Hamilton um my idea was so that if the apocalypse does happen okay. and, and internet is still a thing yeah. with Starlink, maybe it is. Yeah. Um, I think that most everyone should be able to share a skill online with other people in their community. And the best way to do that is through short form video. So if you are really good at canning or you do gardening or you do fishing or whatever it might be. We're no longer in the age where posting a video about how to do something is self-serving yeah. or arrogant. Mm -hmm. It's just not the case anymore. And I think it's really valuable for you. If you have a skill set in your community to be able to pick up your phone, tell somebody how to do something with the attitude that you're going to provide them something of value. And I think that that's going to be really valuable if crap hits the fan, being able to share really short snippets about how to do things in an entertaining way. And they, it doesn't have to get a lot of views. Just show it to your friends. So. I, that's, that is a great uh, – so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say – I'm going to really double down on that one and say that that's excellent for a couple of reasons. One, sharing skills are, are, are critical because um, – obviously that's that's what education is. It's the transference of, of knowledge right. from, from one generation to the next or from one person to another person. But you, you will learn a lot about how to actually explain doing something when you when you set up your little camera or you set up your phone or whatever it is and try to explain it in like a limited time frame. So you're not taking 30 minutes to explain something. Now, some skill sets do require that. Yeah. But if it's something like how to can. A trick. Yeah, how to can. Yeah, a trick. Or it doesn't even have to be a complete skill set. It can just be like a trick or a shortcut or a, or a life hack or something like that. But sharing that knowledge is, is, one, it's very beneficial. You're automatically adding value to someone when, they, when mm -hmm. they watch or they see what you're doing. Two, you learn a little bit about how to effectively explain something. Yes. How to effectively teach. And everyone always says that you will learn more through teaching than you will from you know, just, just sitting there and being the student. And, it, and there's a lot of truth in that. You will learn how to actually refine and make things better. And if you enjoy it, you'll find yourself doing it more and more. And I will tell you right now, like everything I have learned about Gardening, everything I've learned about livestock, every almost I would say eighty five percent of it has been watching people online that took the time to teach me how to do something, mm -hmm. and and I, I I would say right now when I watch most of the most of the like the quote entertainment that I consume now. It's not streaming on Netflix. Yeah, it's watching YouTube videos of people doing like really cool stuff, and and me being able to learn how to do that by watching them do it. So I I think. Commit, okay, 90 days, you're going to commit. There's something you know, a life hack, 
a skill set, a capability, something, yeah. and you're going to learn how to properly, like on a video of that, maybe come up with like the three points that you want to get across, mm -hmm. and then publish it somewhere. Yeah, Even if it's on, just sharing with friends. Just on Instagram Reels, you don't have to yeah. start a YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, nothing nothing, nothing sexy. All right, all right. somebody here said, oh, who was it? Oh, man, I, I lost them because they had a, a good one. Um, they said they're going to teach their kids how to shoot. Oh, Major Chris Holm, teach my wife and kids how to shoot. Great. So I would say that yeah, shooting is a shooting is a is a great one, um, and and here's and here's what I, here's what I'm gonna add on to that. Um, I'll give you credit there, Chris. Um, don't teach someone how to shoot; just target shoot. Um, one, it's the lamest form of shooting, um, even though it's still fun. But um, actually, teach someone, and I, I'm I'm going through this with my my kids this summer. Um, if you're going to get a concealed carry, all right, if you're sitting there and the only experience you've ever had at the range is going to the range and just like sitting there and, and shooting at a target, you're not prepared. You're not prepared. That's nothing, right? That, it's good that you know. I'm sure, I shouldn't say that. It's not nothing. It's good that you know. It's good that you understand. Like, because the first thing you need to learn with a, a firearm is how to safely handle it. Mm -hmm. How to safely handle it, load it, unload it, shoot it. Which makes the draw really it. important because the yes. draw is where people make stupid mistakes, yes. especially if they're carrying hot. Absolutely. And carrying hot means you got a round in the chamber, not a round in the magazine. And if you're not carrying hot, then you might as well not even be carrying. Right. What you got is a what you got is a brick to hit somebody with. All right. So yeah, learn how to learn how to shoot a gun properly. And so I would say safe safe handling that you always have to start with safe handling. What is the etiquette with respect to handling a weapon safely? And that means loading, unloading, carrying, shooting, etc. Um, but take it to that next level. So like with with me and my kids this this summer. We're going to go through the process of if you have, if you're carrying concealed, what is the process of like going lift up your shirt, point one, point two, point three, point four, shooting, like all that stuff um, and, and how to do that effectively and safely. That's excellent. I also high, highly suggest women to do this because yeah. when bad things are happening um, in the world, in the past, women have been kind of helpless and have been the target of a lot of things, you know, when when marauders were coming in and yeah. raping and pillaging. I mean, there's a reason. Who are they raping? They're raping the women because the women can't um, defend themselves. Well, firearms are an excellent equalizer. Yeah. And it's not enough just to have a gun. It's not enough just to know how to shoot the gun. You have to know what the process is to rack it, to draw yeah. it, to yeah. make sure that you're you're accurate in your in your shooting. Um, Nick did some drills with me because I was having an issue where I was flinching right before I pulled the trigger yeah. and it would throw my shot off. And so he would stand there and, and have me not look and either I had one in the chamber or I didn't. And well, I was I... supposed to pull the trigger and, and so let, yeah, let me, let me explain. It, it helped me to, it helped me when there was nothing, when there was not around and I, that's when I would see the tip of my gun shift yeah. a little bit because mm -hmm. I was hesitating. And, and that just takes practice. Yeah. The, yeah. the way, the way the drill works is someone, someone has the firearm and then they're, so they're standing behind you. They have the firearm, they have your magazine, right? Sometimes they put a round in, sometimes they don't, then they hand it back. So you got one shot, right? And then you're, you're going through the process of slowly squeezing the trigger. You're getting your trigger pulled down. You're getting your breathing down. You're getting all that down. And a lot of times people are jerking the trigger. So it's either going left or right or it's going up or down. They're like flinching. They're doing all those other things. And they will swear to God they're not doing it. Yeah. Swear they, to God they're not doing it. They don't know that they're doing yeah. it. Yeah. And then as soon as you take that round out and they're going through the whole process and, and they they do that, they anticipate. Yeah. It's like, okay, that's they what I'm talking it. about. Squeeze. Don't worry about the round going off. Squeeze the trigger until it goes off. And so that's one of those drills that you can use. It's like it's don't let the, the bang scare you. Yeah. You have to the, breathe through But it. you really have to practice that draw. I, I will just mm -hmm. say this right now. If you're going to go out there and learn how to kind of do what you would tactical shooting or yeah. whatnot, learn how to practice I mean, that people draw. have accidental discharges when they go to draw, especially with really small guns. Apparently, yeah. Um, like really small little concealed carry guns. A lot of times that's what women want is something really, really small. Yeah. The problem is, is that you have to be so used to drawing that you don't accidentally, you know, loop a finger in and, and yeah. pull the trigger. You, you don't want that to happen. It's very important to, you know, to know for sure that you're not going to make that mistake because yeah. that's a good way to, you know, <laughs> shoot yourself in the leg or in the yeah. foot. The, Adding one thing to this, just as important as practicing your draw, 
knowing if you have a round in the chamber and practicing all that, situational forethought and putting an immense amount of time into thinking, what situations would I draw my gun in public? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And being certain about that. But yeah. you, you've got to think about if I was in a gas station, what would happen that would tell me that I needed to draw my gun? Yeah, cause because you never want to use a gun just to scare people off. Right. Yeah. Like right. you don't you will, you pull will, it and start waving it around that you better be ready to use it if you do that. You, you need to know in your own home what would happen right, when you draw right. my gun. Obviously, you're probably going to draw your firearm in your own home much, much sooner than you would in a public location. Yeah. But if you're at a gas station, grocery store, what has to happen? For me to draw my gun. Well, and can I just say, like, a, a lot of this, too, uh, when you, when you again, if you're just going to the range and you're just target shooting, that's fun. You can learn some valuable principles with respect to accuracy, safety, all those other things. It is significantly more fun <laughs> when you're going to the range with somebody that knows what they're doing, that has been through some tactical shooting. I mean, I used to train people how to shoot. That was part of what I, part of what I did as a, as a Green Beret. And um, we would do different drills. Like you'd be sitting down at a table. Oh, you got You got to draw now, right? You're sitting down at a table. We call them the meetings gone bad drills <laughs> and stuff like that. We practice things like you run out of ammo and you got to switch magazines. Like there's, there's all sorts of things like that that you can do that actually consume less ammunition but are more fun because you're going through the process and you're really learning how to effectively, you know, react and how to do things. So, all right. So we're going to go shooting. Good good recommendation from Major. I'm going to do another one here. Learning how to fight. Okay. Learning learning how to fight. And again, some of these when we say take the next 90 days and commit to it, obviously you're not going to be, you know, an MMA world champion after 90 days. But the point is is to pick something that you a capability or skill that you don't currently have. Could be, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, could be MMA sort of stuff. It could be um uh, could be uh, boxing, whatever it is, some some sort of physical, you know, martial art, right? And when we say the 90 days, it's like, no, just commit to doing something consistently over a 90-day period. And at the end of the 90 days, you might decide, I don't really particularly like this, or I'd rather do something else. Or you, you might you just say, you know what, this is, this is a part of my routine now. It's a part of my... Here, here's one important thing. It would be better to use physical force against a threat that was not wielding a firearm and disarm that person or, you know, make them not a threat, then pull your gun and shoot them. Well, and and the part of the thing here, too, is that not everyone is going to be carrying a firearm everywhere they go. I know some people do, and that that's great. I'm no, no problem. There's also going to be some areas where you're legally not permitted to carry, right? So so being able to physically, being able to physically defend yourself, being able to physically defend your family, right, is, is an important thing to do. And and I and I will say this. We used to, we used to joke and, you know... <laughs> When, when SF guys, we would all, when we would go somewhere or you'd walk in another place, you could usually tell who the other operators were within a, there's a way they carry themselves. There's a way that they act. There's a way that they sit at the table. There's a way that all of those things are, are indicators. And I, and I will tell you this, that one of the most interesting things we learned from Iraq is that the bad guys learned really, really quickly whose vehicles were which. Like our vehicles looked a little bit different we didn't get hit as much. And the reason why we didn't get hit as much, we were a hard target. Because if, if you, if you try to do an IED against us or you took a pot shot at us, we were, we were bringing all of hell with us, right? Like that we were, we were, we took that stuff real personal, right? They would actually target vehicles where everyone was buttoned up or, or what they thought was a supply convoy. Now, there, there was other tactical reasons to hit a supply convoy, but it was also the assumption that these people do not have the same level of training in reaction because they didn't. They didn't have the same firepower. They didn't have the same training. Plus, their job was just to get supplies from one area to another area. Their job was not to close with and kill the enemy. Ours was. And so part of what I'm talking about here is when you're taking care of yourself, when you're physically fit, when you like know how to, understand, how to operate in a dangerous or violent situation, chances are, you're less likely to be subjected to one of them, right? And you're far less likely to actually That's be a victim. That's so fascinating. That yeah. I, I, the, the, the skill that I have, unfortunately, a lot of people are going to be upset or disappointed, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> um, no, I mean, a lot of the, the people that are going to be watching this either live or after we publish it, 
you know, they're probably thinking uh, we keep using the word apocalypse scenario. This is not all for the apocalypse. This is making you a better person. A lot of it sounds like it's basically prepping for, you know. But when, it, when, it, it works either way, though. That's yeah. the thing is it benefits you either way. Yeah, we're not talking but about like, – you'll notice we don't have anything on here on, like, you know, tanning hides just yet, right? Like it's – Well, we haven't gotten to me yet. So. I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for the, you know, like, follow-up episode for this, which is how to be your own local warlord. Um, but, like – no, th- this Why skills- would I teach someone to do what my job will be? <laughs> <laughs> the um, the skill set, I, w- I would be okay with that. The yeah. the um, the skill. I mean, look, we tried to get Nick elected to U.S. Senate <laughs> and Congress before. So, um, but like the um, the skill set that I'm working on right now, I could say, unfortunately, it's not as sexy as learn how to do Brazilian jitsu, jujitsu. Ju- but oh, what's yours? Um, it's it's how to make long form content for for videos okay. for for things like YouTube. It's something that I've been working with our video editor Cody on. Um, we've got we've got one thing that's that's in the works right now that will be published probably in the next couple of weeks or so. And I'm I'm really excited to see how it'll you know how it's going to perform because I did the research and script writing for that. Nick did the the recording for it, and Cody did the video editing for it. And I think the three of us working together on it will will end up making something pretty pretty neat. And this is kind of like a trial run, but the the goal over the course of the summer is to get to a point where we can start putting out more long form content because Nick has done really well with the short form content. And I think we've done pretty well on on like the podcast. I mean, we've got more people that tune into this now than have have ever tuned into it. But um, there's a there's a lot of things that we want to talk about that you know relate to history, economics, philosophy, government, politics, all that stuff, right? And YouTube is the place to to do it. YouTube has basically, in some ways, you want to talk about like intentional communities and stuff like that. YouTube, in many ways, has replaced the university system. Mm-hmm. For, I for the better for the better I <laughs> yeah. have and, and so like for all those people that, that that think the only way that you you combat the left is you just lift weights and learn how to shoot that is not the only way that you do it you have to undermine the left's control of all of our institutions and one of the institutions that they have complete control over is academia well I, I'll, I it, it, to, to be honest as somebody who has a college degree is about to get another one mm-hmm. I've learned more from watching YouTube videos within the realm of politics and history, which are the two things that I, I've gotten my degrees in, than I did from four years of undergrad and two years in postgrad. Well, and I, I think it's, no, I think it's an incredibly valid point in part because so many people now are wondering, how do I get, like, how do I actually homeschool my kids? That That is becoming far more popular these days. And YouTube's an incredible resource. And for those people out there that have done this, that have had some success um, you actually developing content to be able to share with others. And by the way, you can get paid for it too, right? Like this is, mm-hmm. this is a potential way to actually get a side hustle. So you're not completely dependent on whatever that, you know, check is currently coming in. It's really hard to do. <laughs> it, it is hard to do, but it's, it's possible. And, and the point is, is that you, you do, you have this incredible ability to form an online community in addition to the, your, your, your physical one that's, you know, kind of around you and geographical. Um, you, you have the ability to do that, but you also have the ability to share of your experiences, yeah. your training, things like this. So this goes into kind of what Hamilton was also talking about and what you're talking about is how do you how do you take the information, the experiences, the skill sets and capabilities that you have and then share them with a larger mm-hmm. audience? Or how do you actually share the sort of philosophies that we're talking about? Look, none of us want to live in a, in a situation where society's collapsed, right? Yeah. That, well, Anyway, nobody should want to live in a society. <laughs> where nobody should want to live in Mad Max land, right? Um, because everyone thinks they're going to be the warlord. You're probably not, right? So, um, so, but, so develop. So, being able to actually fight back within these cultural inst- within these cultural spaces is really critical. And, yeah. and and we've found a way to do it with short form content, with long form content. And so, I, I think that's a good suggestion well, to play off that. I I personally believe that. What the conservative movement needs before a lot of things is people who love to create Mm -hmm. YouTube content, homesteading content, whatever type of content it is that can also subtly bring about a message through their content of conservatism, liberty, um, that are operating in niches that aren't necessarily political. Um, And, you know, playing off of that, uh, people use YouTube for a lot of different things. And a lot of times it's just for entertainment and you know, if you find our podcast entertaining, that's great. Love that. Um, but there are so many different areas of YouTube that you can learn from. And I would encourage everyone. I was, I think I was going to put this under the intellectual or 
capabilities. Okay. I would really encourage everyone, if you are interested in a specific hobby, to search out content on YouTube related to that because I think what you're going to find is kind of an intentional community like Christian was saying, and then you might even find yourself getting more passionate about that hobby and more excited to do those things. And there's just there's so many things within YouTube that can bring value to your life. Um, you know, I, I used to get on to some family members about spending so much time watching the news. Yeah. And uh, this family member w- ended up, you know, watching a lot of things about interior design, um, things of that nature, and has actually replaced a lot of their consumption of news with things that they're interested in, their hobbies. And yeah. I think that that has been very beneficial. It's what, worth what, noting that, like, our our episode from from Thursday was a reaction to a YouTube video that somebody yeah. else made. It was it was a what I felt his video, and he puts out all sorts of long form content about mostly either history or philosophy and that type of stuff. And and obviously a lot of what he talks about has you know little bearing to the focus of this podcast. But that one episode did, and and it was. I remember at the time I was thinking like. Because Tyler sent it to me, and so I watched it when I was driving down to a um, wedding in Georgia for a family member. And I, um, well, I didn't watch it, right? I listened to it, right? And um, I I liked it enough that I sent it to, to you yeah. and Tina, and I was like, I want your take on it. And and then we decided, you know, oh, it was interesting, but we were just talking about it ourselves. And then we finally got to this point, like, a couple weeks later, yeah, like, maybe, maybe we should do, like, a reaction to it. And in retrospect, I'm I'm so glad that we did because that last episode is probably going to end up being like our top performing episode ever so yeah. far. Well, and, and the reason I bring that up is because none of that would have been able to happen had this one guy not d- made this video to begin with. And so, like, that is a skill set, learning how to make longer form content on the topics that, that you appreciate, especially if it if it deals with with teaching people how to how to push back against the left's agenda like i said earlier like the left has completely taken over academia our best mechanism to undermine it is not school choice actually i nick fights for that's his number one issue in in politics but i actually don't think school choice is the number one way to to push back against it i i think it's the number two way to push back against it i think the number one way to push back against it is through platforms like youtube well i I think again if one of the the reason why we talk so much about school choice from a political perspective is because that that has been such a massive source of influence with respect to kind of like the woke progressive ideology starting at ever and ever younger ages within our school system. And that's one of the primary areas where parents are like, we've got to fix this. And I've told parents before, like, okay, I, I agree. And you should do that. Do you think you're going to fix it within the next 12 years? Like, do you honestly think you're going to fix something that's taken decades to have in the next 12 years? No. I'm like, then you need to strongly consider removing your child from the situation that you've identified as being potentially harmful for their education, socialization, worldview, et cetera. Like, and it's always like, well, how do I do it? YouTube is actually a great way to, to do that. Somebody asked a good question like, well, how do you save all this stuff if all of a sudden you're banned or you're kicked off? Well, keep in mind, when you actually have to create the content, you own the content. You have the content. Yeah. YouTube's just a platform that allows you to easily share it. So when we talk about YouTube being beneficial, we're not doing this because we, we love, love all YouTube, the people yeah. that, you know, no, it's it's a good platform to be able to use. It's a tool. It's used for a lot of bad things. Mm-hmm. can also be used for good things. Use it for good things. Yeah. We get we, a lot of people that are like, why are you even on YouTube? You should just be on Rumble. And the problem is, is there just isn't as many people to see it on Rumble. Well, and you can look at the numbers. They're just not there. I think I think the bigger problem is, is if you're only on Rumble, you have exited the playing field yeah. of YouTube in the battle of ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, but to keep in mind that the content that people create doesn't always have to be political, that if we aren't going to strategize in such a way that allows us to communicate with the middle ground people, the people that are apolitical, that don't consume anything about politics, we can't just create political content. Yeah, And we have to be strategic in how we reach those people. And so by investing in niches and hobbies and things that are not political and subtly communicating our beliefs through those areas, I think we win in the long run. Yeah. All right, Tina, what's yours? Okay, so... It's really hard because I, I have a hard time like narrowing it down. It, it it's um, learn how to do something that typically you would buy something complete, ah, but you are going to learn how to make whatever this is. So I have a couple of examples. Um, for instance, um, when it 
mayonnaise, guys. Oh, mayonnaise. there you go. I learned how to make mayonnaise. Um, getting back to let's get a, get away from a lot of processed stuff, right? Yeah. And I learned how to make mayonnaise. What a white person thing to say, I guess. But <laughs> anyway, um, so there's this whole argument between best foods and and uh, best foods are Hellman's and uh, what's the other one? Dukes. Dukes. And somebody was having this big, you know, thing back and forth on which one's better. And my answer was make your own. That is way better. Uh, Nick doesn't necessarily love it because Nick loves artificial weird things. <laughs> That's um, <not> true. <laughs> You do like even the oh artificial mac and cheese, like the mo more artificial, the mac and cheese, the more Nick likes it. Um, That's not but, true anymore. Oh, okay. It okay. It used to be true. But anyway, I would say get your taste buds used to real food again. Um, so whether it's even, even like people buy bottled ranch dressing, I make my own ranch dressing with my own mayonnaise and it's fantastic and everybody loves it. Uh, it's a completely different animal, totally different. Um, so, Find things that you would normally buy complete and mm -hmm. make them. Well, because you've also, you've made clothes, you've made, I mean. It's not just, you know, food items, but yeah. I mean, there are plenty of food items that I do that with. Um, I, I try not to do a lot of artificial or, or heavily processed foods. Yeah. Um, but learn how to, uh, like, I know how to sew. I know how to can. I know you make yourself valuable in a situation where you can't have clothes. I think canning taken is to a, your doorstep or, you my know, my mother loves canning. It, so it takes up a lot of prep, space yeah. and there's, there's a lot to do with it. So you've got to, it's a lot on the front end trying to buy the items for it, but learn how to do those things because if the stuff really does hit the fan, you at least have something because not everybody can be the protector person out there like security securing like the borders of the compound. Okay. Need the gatherers Some, too. Somebody needs to be able to sew. Somebody yeah. needs to be able to cook or can or preserve food in some way, whether they're drying it or preserving it some other way. Um, so learn how to do something like that. Um, or, Learn how to build something. Yeah. You know, back to using YouTube videos in order to learn how to do things. I, ev almost everything I do um, starts off with me researching several YouTube videos on how to do it. And I can't tell you how many women have come up to me and, and said, I, I can't believe you can do that. I could never do that. And I go, it's because I'm willing to fail. Yeah. It's not that I'm better at anything than anybody else. I can pretty much do things fairly half decently, <laughs> but... Um, but it's not because I'm great at everything. It's because I'm willing to, I'm willing to do a bad job learning how to do it until I figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. So you just can't be afraid to fail. Well, and there's, there's interesting stuff too. Like, so for instance, Tina's, Tina's also like the barber in the family. Yeah. I've, I've been cutting the yeah. hair <laughs> since, um, we got married yeah. and at the beginning, uh, we had a few times where I did have to just <laughs> shave it completely off. <laughs> Um, but it was definitely a learning process. But now <laughs> nobody else cuts Nick's hair correctly, and so I have to cut it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I basically did the hair for the whole family yeah. growing up. I mean, well, we've, and, we've and literally never taken our family to get haircuts. The, <laughs> the, amount, the amount of money that Tina has saved us from doing that. and Because like, Nick needs a weekly haircut every <laughs> I, I week. I having long. Well, the other thing, too, is like stuff like, like the sewing and like, you know, making clothes and things like that. I, like the amount of money Tina saved us on Halloween costumes for the kids and things like that when they were doing stuff. I mean, th those skills are, there's a, there's a real, there's an obvious practical benefit to knowing how to do this in an extreme situation. But it also provides a great deal of value um, in non-extreme situations. And, and you'll notice like a lot, all the stuff that we're talking about here, this is valuable regardless. It, it is valuable in a bad situation. It's valuable in a great situation because that's the other thing too is when Tina designed some of this stuff, like when she built this table for the office, this saved us a ton of money. If we had gone on and tried to buy this table, it would have cost at least three times as much. If we had Easy. bought this table, we wouldn't perfect. have gotten it into the studio. Yeah, yeah. Well, well we, I had yeah. to assemble it in the room. It's too big to make it up the stairs. So there, there it's things like that. It's things that um, it bring valuable, bring value both to, to your family with respect to your own budget, but can also be profitable in certain situations as well. And then again, you just never know. And and again, I I would argue that like for for Tina, who loves to build, likes to you know do the clothes and stuff like that. Um, 
there's it's been fun too. It's a fun skill set to have. Not only that, but like our kids appreciate things more when like Tina's made something for them as opposed to and gets to like kind of work with them on what the design looks like. Um, the canning and food preservation. I've gotten more into like drying, like you know, being able to like you know dehydrate like fruit and stuff like yeah. that and 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 things like that. Because there are some things like I've tried yeah. that I've failed miserably at and the kids won't let me live it down so i tried i tried to make ketchup once oh yeah don't do it don't it's no didn't yeah. work it did not work <laughs> and you don't really need ketchup that bad oh it depends on who you wait, ask, wait until but, you have kids hoss i'm gonna yeah. tell you right now it becomes the wonder oh, nectar of the gods for i love <laughs> ketchup but if i if i had to, had to choose between going without it and making it myself i'm going without it <laughs> well and, and i here's the other thing i'll say about canning preserving food like one of the shows i watch is uh uh justin rhodes um they're one of the homesteading channels that i watch really interesting stuff they don't do any canning for the food preservation they freeze everything um, which is, which again, they, they think is more, and, and that's an easier way to preserve it, you know, I mean, but it requires power, but it requires power, right? So it, it, re, it requires the ability that if you're, if you're off grid or you don't have a, a good, you know, backup for it, that you could yeah. lose a lot of food in a short period of time, the benefit of canning, the benefit of doing something like building a root shell, uh, or a root cellar, et cetera, is that it, you, you're not relying on the grid or the power. And again, I'm not even talking about extreme situations. If we don't lose our power for at least three days, once a year. And it's not like, it's not like we live in the middle of nowhere. If we don't lose it for at least three days, once a year, it, it's been a banner year for us here in, in Culpeper, Virginia. What do you, what do you think about solar? I, you know, my whole thing is always, people always act like, oh, you hate green energy because you don't want all these solar subsidies. No, what I hate is government manipulation of an industry. Uh, but no, I, I think I, I love the fact that solar has become more and more um, effective it's been it's become more practical within the marketplace. Um, no, I got I got no problem with those forms of energy. I think they're excellent. I would love to have solar panels uh, one day on our property. Um, you know, it's still it's still pretty expensive. That's why yeah. they keep pushing the subsidies and everything else. But uh, but no, I, I think it's I think it's a great option for people. All right, let's talk about um, let's talk about some experiences um, or things. So we've we've talked a lot about capabilities, skills. You know, sewing, shooting, hunting, canning, food preservation, learning how to build something, learning how to make something, learning how to like learn actually how to teach, grow things. learning how to teach, learning how to grow things. Yeah. Gardening. That's a, that's a huge one. I That's one thing I would tell everybody like in the, over this next 90 days, pick one thing you're going to grow. Because in, in most of the United States, which is where most of our viewership is, we're, 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 in, we're in zone seven. The, the season is like. After Mother's Day is when we all plant our tomatoes, pretty much in in Virginia. After yeah. right after Mother's Day, unless you got a greenhouse or hoop house, usually you get a winter's revenge cold snap. Pick something if you've never grown anything, if you've never grown food before, pick something. And I would recommend zucchini um, or tomatoes because zucchini is super easy to make. It's zucchini the, is confidence. disgusting. I will never grow zucchini. Oh. My parents grew it. They have a garden. Sir, this is a Wendy's. Calm down. All right. Like, <laughs> you want to talk to a manager? I'm going to go full Karen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want, no, I, I'm, I'm just having PTSD flashbacks. Like how do your parents even cook zucchini my, if you my, hate it so bad? My parents have a garden and they grow a lot of their own uh, vegetables and they, they have done so for well over a decade. And they I'm would convinced grow, it's the cooking. They would you, grow zucchinis, and I, they they would, we would eat them all the time when I lived with my parents well, growing up, no. and I hated zucchini. There's, a, I mean, you can make noodles out of zucchini and stuff oh, like that. It's terrible. They're not that bad, actually. Actually, I actually think zucchini. What about zucchini bread? Oh, zucchini. I love no, zucchini. No, I do delicious. not like anything involving Christian, zucchinis. Christian, no. Christian, then don't grow it. I know. I'm you'll, a, you'll notice I'm a full grown adult now. You'll, you'll notice I didn't Nobody. say I'm going to pass the law requiring Christian Hines to grow zucchini. <laughs> I offered it up as a, as a staple because, one, it has, it's, it's diverse with respect to how you can use it and super easy to grow with very high yields. So if, if, you're, yeah. if you're entering into this space for the first time and you don't want to be discouraged, like don't start with carrots. Right, potatoes are oh, super easy. Are so hard to grow. Potatoes are super easy. Tomatoes are, are a little bit more temperamental, but they're so. I mean, you so much I of your stuff is tomato based. Tomatoes, yeah. I absolutely love them. Yeah, tomatoes. I, those, those are all good things to grow off. So pick pick a plant, pick some food that you're going to grow this year, and don't pick basil. Like basil is great. I love basil. We grow a lot of basil, but like pick something, pick something hearty. Pick something substantive. Yeah. Okay, like you, you said hearty. So here's a question. I, I, I yeah. this is a question because I don't know. Like, how easy is it to grow carrots? 
hard. It's, it's not it that hard? It's, it's not that it's super difficult. It's it's just that out of the, if I'm telling a beginner to grow something, I'm probably not going to start off with carrots. Now, okay. other people might disagree. It's just too easy to mess it up and end up with these squatty, tiny little yeah. things that aren't even very good. Like if you if you want something that's like a really like nutrient dense food. Same with like asparagus. Don't grow asparagus straight yeah, out because like, it takes two years to yeah. even be able to harvest it anyway. Cucumbers are super easy. Um, what, what's a, what's good to start at this point in the year? You could still do tomatoes. Plant some tomatoes. Yeah, you, tomatoes. I mean, gosh, you can use them in everything. Yeah, like, salsa. And you can make fresh salsa everything with Italian them. Everything Italian. And, you know. So I, I would like... Bruschetta. I've just been inspired to try this. I have had zero interest in growing anything. Yeah. But I'm inspired now. Uh, so I could do squash, zucchini, sweet potatoes. Is that a possibility right now? Y- y- yeah. I mean, it's not ideal, but yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm growing sweet potatoes right now. Okay. Yeah, I'll you you, you would have wanted you would wanted to I start love, those earlier. I love peppers. Grow peppers. Yeah. Grow some habanero peppers. That that's that good, that's, would be good. So yes. we do. We grow a lot yeah. of habaneros, a lot of banana peppers. And I make this habanero jelly that oh is my so gosh. good. It's incredible. Christian, you've had my habanero yeah. jelly, right? That, that's okay. why I said I really like. Uh, yeah. I, and I'm a huge fan of spicy foods in general. So yeah. well, and the other thing yeah. too with a lot of this stuff too, you don't need a lot of space. Like one of the, I'm growing my potatoes right now in a fabric bag. So you, you can get these fabric bags, or, or you don't even need that. I mean, a lot of people grow things in whatever, like feedstock bags. But I, I have the fabric ones because I just, like, I think it drains better and whatnot. But I'm growing potatoes in there, and it is really simple. It's really easy to do, nutrient-dense food. We Bastiat have a lot of says, people suggesting marijuana. Bastiat says <laughs> hearty, <laughs> substantive marijuana. <laughs> that's a cash crop right there. That's that's going to be for your, that's going to, you ask, like, what's the currency going to be when the dollar goes away? Well, yeah. <laughs> the 420 if you wanna, standard. If you want a crop that you can smell, like, a mile oh away that is nauseating, Go for you it. You know what though? Industrial <laughs> hemp, like you want to talk about a it a, stinks though. You want to talk about too. a fiber. Does industrial hemp is, stink too? Yeah, they they both stink. But well, industri- I, sh- I know that maybe I shouldn't have said that, but I, I was about to be like, I know that marijuana uh, marijuana smells terrible. It stinks. It it, it 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 smells like a skunk died. But like hemp, I've I've like held hemp rope in my hands, and I don't necessarily remember it like smelling. No, really it's processed at that point. Yeah. Well, the other thing I would say, okay, so here's the other thing that I think if you've got if you've got any amount of property and there's no legal prohibition on it, right? Here we go. What if it's illegal? Sh- do it anyway. <laughs> chickens. <laughs> Get chickens. chickens. Get if you've never had any sort of livestock before and you're looking for the gateway drug. And if people give you a livestock. hard time with it, tell them your chicken identifies as a cat or a dog and you'll be fine. My That's mother right. is gonna love this. We live episode. in twenty twenty three, y'all. <laughs> Get, get yourself five hens, five laying hens. You can get them at Tractor Supply. You can get them at, like, Farmer Co-ops. Yeah. Like, we have CFC And just tell people them. that they are your emotional support animals. Yeah. And they're your emotional they're support hens. And then get yeah. one rooster. That That's – so, again, yeah, I'm, not I'm, saying, necessarily. I'm saying you don't need the rooster, um, which I'm sure the feminists will love that I'm saying this. You don't need the rooster right up there. Now, in our property, we absolutely have to have a rooster because that rooster does protect the flock. That yeah, rooster it patrols. Protects the flock. He's such a good rooster. I, yeah. I, the reason I also say get a rooster, too. Uh, by the way, this is the one thing out of – I. this has not been my episode in case anybody has, hasn't realized. I'm just – we've talked about a lot of stuff that I, I don't have a lot of expertise to share on. Yeah. Um, but – this is actually one thing that I, I can talk about. My mother's going to be laughing so hard because growing up, I hated taking care of the chickens. Yeah. But I know I know how to take care of chickens. Yeah. Um, we've got 40 chickens at my mother's house, um, or at least. I think we've got 35. And no, we well, we're about. I'm not counting. We, the we have about chickens. 35 in the coop right now. Oh, okay. We, uh, we have more going in. And um, roosters are very important to protect because we, my, my parents live in a very rural area. Yeah. Um, rural part of Culpeper, and there would be foxes that would come along and snakes and all sorts of stuff. And yeah. and the roosters help protect those things. They do. Now, we will also have a, a gun laying, <laughs> you know, relatively close to the back door in order to finish the job if the rooster couldn't. That's no, we, the, we support our roosters right to keep and bear arms. Yes, so we, but <laughs> the, the reason I say that is to not just defend the flock, but also also to grow the flock. Yeah. Um, one of the things that my mother does is she, she hatches and raises her own chickens now, too. Oh, that's awesome. And um, that's, that's not that's not as it's actually not as easy as you might it think. It is not as easy as you might think. Yeah. Not, not at all. You need a chicken to be broody. The other thing that's no, fun no, about no. having I chickens. No, no, no. I have an incubator, and it's super easy with an well, incubator. Well, yeah, with incubator, but I'm talking about if you just do it without the incubator, if you're just waiting for, like, Okay, you but you can get, hand. like, a cheap incubator on Amazon and incubate yeah. your own eggs. No, and it's true. And it's not, it's not hard at all. Yeah. You just got to 
follow the directions. Yeah. Well, I will say this. The other thing that's fun about having, so chickens, obviously that's a, it's an excellent source of protein. Um, one, one of the actually the best ways to preserve eggs is noodles, make homemade noodles, which are also delicious. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk about the big fail on that though? Oh my God. Okay. So I Luke, one of Luke's assignments because Luke loves noodles and we were looking for how to preserve because we had tons we were getting like almost over a dozen eggs a day. It, <laughs> like for a while there it was just nuts. We couldn't give them away. How many enough. chickens? This at that at point, that it, was point 30. it was no, it was fourteen chickens. That's it. We were getting a dozen a day off of fourteen chickens. Okay, so yeah. fourteen over a dozen a day, and we're yeah. trying to like okay, we're we're eating them, we're giving them away. I love eggs, so I, I'll I'll destroy eggs. But we're like, all right, how do we preserve these? Make homemade noodles. So Luke made. I, I said you have to make at least like I think it was two pounds after like once they're dry, two pounds of noodles using this method. So he had to go on, he had to research it, he had to find a YouTube video that was appropriate, he had to go through the process, made them all, was sitting there letting them dry, we didn't use like anything. You, and you, you made him go do the research for yo, this, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. Yeah, it, it, well, because that's, can I just say as a little segue here from the homeschooling perspective, so many parents are nervous about, I don't know how to do all this stuff. Yeah, you're not gonna know how to do everything. Go make them research. Yeah. Because that's part of that's part of the experience. That's part, part of, of being learning. An adult. Yeah, part of learning is learning how to do your own dang research. I'm not here to hold your hand on everything. So I told Luke, go, go figure this out, but make it happen and make it happen by this time. So he gets it all done. All of his noodles are laying there. He puts it in They're uh, drying. He puts it in drying where my, my plants are and I move them down to a lower level. Dog comes in and gets all of the Eight. noodles. All of the noodles. All of the noodles. All of them. But but Luke's part was a success, right? Hey, Luke did his job. Luke did his job. But the he dogs. Was, he was good. The dogs did what they do. Stupid yes. dogs. All right. <laughs> so yeah, get get some get some chickens. That's it's actually a lot of fun. They 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 are they're very comical to watch too. They're, yeah. They're they're fun. What yeah. about chicken houses? Like, do you need to just build one? Build one. Okay. Okay, <laughs> you guys. It's really Nick's like just build one. I built it, and it's lasted what like. 10 years and it's yeah. really time to build another one. Really? Yeah. Um, I'm just saying people go for all these like super sexy chicken houses that are s pretty expensive. That's great if you can do it or you can afford it, you know, got the time. But I'm telling you right now, you can you can make something that is perfectly adequate. Mm -hmm. for as chickens. long as you secure it, you yeah. ha it has to close up tight. You've got to have everything uh, screwed in tight. You can't have big gaps or anything like that. And, and you need to have a place for them to roost and some nesting boxes. And you need to keep it clean. Um, yeah. And so we do the deep bedding method where instead of shoveling it out every single week, we go in and we add more bedding and more bedding and more bedding and just cover, cover, cover. And then we every so often go in and clear it completely out yeah. and start fresh. Well, and that makes compost too. So it's yeah. like when you, when you actually get all the wood chips and all that stuff out, you put that in a pile. Now chicken manure is not like cow manure or stuff like that, where you can almost like directly throw it's it into too your garden. Hot. It's too hot. You got to let it dry out. But anyways, yeah. the other one I'm surprised Tina didn't bring up is a particular livestock option. Queen of the bees. Yeah. Well, they're not livestock. Yeah, they are, are they? Yeah. Okay. They're alive. They're stock. Yeah. They're producing something. Okay. I'm calling them livestock. Well, the bees are really cool. A lot of people are nervous about bees. Make sure you do your research before you get a hive. But yeah, yeah. if you've been thinking about getting a hive, just do it. Yeah. yeah. They, they're pretty self-sufficient. You really could leave, you can leave them alone a lot. You don't have to open them up all the time. I would say out of out of all the livestock that you can own, the one that will require the least amount of attention on a day-to-day -day basis is your bees. Yeah, I just got to get out there like once a week. Yeah. If even that, sometimes I can give them more time than that. What are you doing once a week? You like, well, you go out there and um, some of it is you're checking to make sure that it's operating properly. So you're taking out frames and you're checking for brood, you're checking for eggs, you're checking for young bees, you're checking to make sure there's no hive beetles or varroa mites. You check for your varroa mites. That is a huge killer of bees. And, um, so you, there are certain things like that. Sometimes you got to treat it if you're going to treat for mites. Um, and so you're just checking and make, making sure that it's functioning as a healthy hive. And if it's doing, because what happens is if it's doing really, really well, and then you close it up and you don't check again for another month, you could check again and it's doing poorly. And it's because you missed somewhere along the line that something has, uh, caused your bees beat your bees to start dying yeah. and so um 
it's important to check every so often, but you kind of want to leave them as alone as much as you can as well. Well, and would you say with a healthy hive, one hive, you could probably get about 75 pounds of honey. I mean, it depends on if you have an eight frame or you have a 10 frame, but, um, healthy 10, healthy 10 frame. You can hive. get, I mean, boy, if, if, it, if your nectar flow is just going gangbusters for the one each year, yeah. you could get a hundred pounds of honey off of one hive in a year the other thing too um, is or, honey. or 50 depends on how much you're leaving for your bees. Yeah. And it also depends on how healthy your bees and, and what the nectar flow is like in your area. Yeah. By the way, fun fact, you want to talk about a food that lasts forever. They have pulled honey out of Egyptian tombs. Yeah. That was still good. There's something else I learned. Yeah. The, the, That's crazy. The whole honey being good. And, and some of that too, you guys is, you're not just going to go and harvest honey. You have to check and make sure that like your frames are capped because if, if you have too much moisture, mm -hmm. then your honey is going to ferment and it's not going to stay honey. It's like, it's too wet. And it's mead. Well, or just bad. Like right, it can grow go. bad things. But I wanted to say there is another thing that I learned and guess where I learned it? YouTube. YouTube. Anyway, I learned that you can tap other trees besides maple trees for syrup you can to make syrup you can tap sycamores which we've got a bazillion sycamores in our area and you tap them when it's cold out so between february and march and apparently you can get some really good stuff off of it's them like a butterscotch they said flavor. it's kind of got a little bit of a butterscotch flavor and you've got to cook it down and get all the water off of it as much water as you can and get it to become a syrup but there is a so basically these are skills to create sugars when everything goes to crap and yeah. and we can't get sugar anymore because shipping is no longer happening or whatever and refining yeah. You know, refining is not happening. You can do this yourself. I watched I watched them turn maple syrup into sugar. Wow. And it's maple sugar, but it's it's a one for one and they turned it into a granulated sugar. All right, let's move on to our next category. Relationship goals. All righty. So we've got single guys here and we've got a married couple here. So um so these, these are the things that you can do over the next 90 days, next 90 days, something that you are going to intentionally do, right, in order to improve either your existing relationship or with, with a create a new yeah, one. Or Talk create a new one. So for instance, I think I think we need to commit, we need to have, we need to have date night. We need we need to have date night. So that, this is that's, a problem for us because yeah. both of us like to stay home. We're both we we don't, Which neither of us want to go into public, home, but yeah, yeah, but we, we need to do, we need to try to do, I would say at least at a bare minimum, once every two weeks, intentional date night. I would next, say we do already. No, I don't think so. I, we don't, we don't intentionally set out to we do We spend it. a lot of time together. So that's one of the reasons we kind of take for granted because we yeah. get to spend so much time together. Uh, we take for granted that we should just go and, you know. All right, Dude. so that's that's one of that's one of the suggestions. Okay. So everybody watching, if you're married, you know you have a, a, a significant significant that you've got to incorporate intentionally for the next ninety it days. It doesn't need to be a date night. It could be just an just activity, a, a, a purposeful date. activity together. Well, and and that isn't yeah, but but the purpose of it is is the the time and connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you got to at least once every two weeks. Starting in June, we, this is June through August. This is what we're doing. June through August, you got to do that. All right, yeah. sorry, Dave. all right, Hamilton. What am I committing what, to? What's, what's, what, what is your what is your next what is your ninety day single guy relationship? Okay, so recently started going to Yale's church. Yeah, it's that's been true. fantastic. Yeah, Good. Um, and this can also be friends too. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take it one step at a time. Yeah. Uh, so I want to get involved in a small group. We This kind of goes into the spiritual as well. They all overlap. Uh, but get involved in a small group and start investing in those relationships and figuring out how I can serve in that area. Mm -hmm. So that's a good one. So, yeah, the small group, like the church small groups, I actually think that's the way it's supposed to be because it's it's – Kind of the New Testament model of the idea of it, it's accountability, it's working together. I know we've been horrible. I've we've been, horrible been so about bad about. We have a life group, group a yeah. small group, yeah, and we we've been very bad about going lately. We do, but all right, that's a good one. So that that's Hamilton's thing is uh, sometime over the next ninety days, it's like getting connected in. Yep. All right, Christian. 
you're just waiting for the girl to magically show up in the house at some point and marry you, right? That's well, the yeah, I mean, quantum fluctuations, theoretically. <laughs> with, a, with a long enough amount of time, a girlfriend will just pop into... If if you wait if you wait a a uh, non infinite amount of time yeah uh, apparently what you will know, materialize everything yeah everything that can't happen will happen but quantum that's mechanics only, says it has to be observed right like otherwise no it, no yeah. I mean and first off that's only under like like certain interpretations <laughs> okay but like, so what are you really going to do so I'm not going to wait a couple trillion years for uh, 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 the the girlfriend equivalent of a Boltzmann brain to pop into existence <laughs> but um. <laughs> I, I don't know. I guess I guess I'm gonna resign myself to having to talk to people. Um, so you're gonna have to go. It's, it's and you're gonna have to go. Here's what I think you should do, Christian. You <laughs> should on. commit you to know, going to social situations. You know what's crazy is that I'm sitting here like lamenting. Oh, I'm gonna have to go talk to people, and here we are at a <laughs> podcast that's gonna get like <laughs> thousands of views. Like I. I, I, it's just a little bit different because for the longest time, I think part well, of the reason it's a relationship interaction. Well, it's one-on-one is very different yeah, than talking. Yeah. To part of the reason that I got so comfortable so quickly with the show in this current format is because like, I know all three of you. And so for the longest time, I just kind of like ignore the fact that other people would listen to what we were talking about. And it just felt like a conversation. Um, but no, in some ways, like I, if, if you get me going on a topic that I care heavily about, yeah, you can go back to some of our previous episodes to see examples of this. I can go for a very long time. I can hold a conversation easily. I can dominate a conversation even. But that does not mean that I'm not a really introverted person at heart. And I'm very introverted at heart. Outside of a narrow field that I feel confident mm-hmm. and interested about discussing, I'm a very introverted person. So... Christian, somebody served potatoes said for every woman you talk to, Christian, get rid of one tab. (laughs) (laughs) I can't get rid of these tabs until I'm done with this dissertation. Most of these most of these tabs are research oriented. But I mean, that that's a goal by the end of the summer is narrow down these tabs to like. Well, but okay, so here's so here's here's the thing. Here's the thing. And our in our quest to get Hamilton and Christian married. Like, I, I, I like Hamilton's plan. Hamilton's plan is through church, right? So it's a community of interest with most likely very shared values. That's a great just, place to look for to a be, spouse. Just to be clear, I'm not joining just to find a I spouse. I know, you're not joining just to find a spouse, but you're putting yourself into social situations. Right. With, with, well, with you, got, the, you have to go where like-minded people have a high probability yeah, to be. Yeah. So, Christian, what is the social event Within the next 90 days, the intentional social event you're going to go to where you're going to get to interact with people in person of similar interests. I, I don't know. Well, I, I, I had no plans to actually guy. do this type of stuff. <laughs> I, <laughs> I just want to sit here He's and like, complain about the market. I, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to actually What about someone? a chess club? What? No. No. No, you're good. At, he's the best at chess. In yeah, this group. yeah. It's, I'm it's not. Actually not I've, I've it's got actually an, not very close. Either. I've got an ELO rating that's like barely 900. It's not that great, but um, no. That, I, that I'm trying would. to go find people to play chess with that are not as good as Christian, so I can win. But um, Hamilton and I have actually we've been doing this thing since January where we try to play at least one chess game every day. Yeah. There's some days where we don't get to play, and then there's other days where we'll play like three or four or five in a row. Um, so we're, we're almost caught up with what yep. we're just over 140 days into the year. And I think we've played like maybe 135 games. So the goal is by the end of the year to get 360 so the, games done, which is cool. And then the, but the question was, but I'm not looking to date. What, what is the social? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You've got to find a social, you've got to find a social event that gets you out of this house. The social event cannot be a party that you throw here. You know, for Tyler, like us. Tyler and his fiance. The yeah. uh, there's two Tylers. There's yeah. there's a Tyler that there's is actually a huge more, fan. but all right. Yes, but <laughs> there's only two that matters within my world. Um, there's there's the um, there's the Tyler that that got into our podcast and is a huge fan of the show and like watches every single episode. Yeah. He also volunteered for Nick's campaign for Congress a few years ago. And then there's the Tyler um, that yeah. I went to college with that that uh, um. Uh, lives in the Shenandoah Valley, very active in Virginia politics as well, but he's yeah. from Central Virginia, not Southwest. And the Central Virginia Tyler, his fiance, um, they're getting married at the end of the fall. I think it's September. Um, by the way, actually, if we ever do another podcast on like relationships or newlyweds or something like that, we should consider bringing them on. Yeah. But um, 
he he and his fiance were like they came over and and I showed them the uh, the the so, studio yeah. and everything, and um, they were like, Christian, we're gonna we're gonna try to to get you set up with somebody. Uh, apparently, they know a few people that they they want to I don't know get me set up on a date with. So I told them, yeah, go ahead. All right, um, there we so go. We'll, we'll see if yeah. that actually happens. Yeah, but, let's go. Um, yeah, we'll 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 see if that plays out. But if if so, I'll I'll throw that on the list of, of things right. to do this. All right, summer. there we go. We got that. And then we can do a whole podcast, like a, re- a Christian reacts podcast, yeah. and he can tell us all the crazy <laughs> stuff that happens on the date. We're gonna make it like one of those secret <laughs> dating shows that where like Christian's got dangerous. Christian's got like this the thing in his terrible. Christian's got like the thing in his ear, and Tina's giving advice like Christian, you know, stop oh scowling. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw one out there relationship, and this is gonna be uh, parental, parental. So I, I was I was thinking this I was thinking this year because uh, you know we, have, we, we just had Mother's Day Father's Day is coming up you know and your kids typically ask you what do you want to play? and I, and I started thinking about this mainly because I'm getting nostalgic right my my oldest daughter is is 20 now um, you know my youngest is 15 my son's 17 so like they are they're all, all having milestone birthdays this yeah. year one will be 16 one will be 18 and one will be 21 yeah. So it's like I'm I'm starting to realize that oh my gosh like there's not a whole lot of time at, at home with all my kids and very very probably very little time um, with all three of them under the the same roof and so one of the things I, I think I'm going to do for Father's Day that I'm going to ask my kids for is I I want them I want them to give me two things I want them to give me one thing that they really appreciate about what what Daddy does you know for them or with them or something like that and one thing that they wish Daddy would change. Um. So those those are the two things I'm asked for each one of my kids. Like, what is what is one thing that you wish Daddy would do better, and what's one thing you really appreciate? And they and it needs to be specific. It it can't be just like I, I want something specific because obviously I want to know what it, it it's interesting sometimes because we don't realize sometimes later on in life what somebody appreciated about you. Um, and I still want well I still got time with my kids, and I still want to know what what's what's the one thing each one of my kids wish I would do that would make me a better dad. Um, and, and it, it's like, it's like giving them permission to critique dad, which I think they'll be fine with, but cause we, we have, I mean, we have, we have a good relationship, but, um, but I was just thinking like from a parental standpoint, that's one thing over the next 90 days I'm going to do is I'm going to have each one of my kids ask me, what's one thing that you appreciated that maybe I didn't know you appreciated. Um, and what's one thing you would like to see change or, or be different. Um, and that, that's going to be, you know, that, that one could be kind of tough sometimes too, but I was like, no, I, I've got this limited opportunity. I've got the, you know, with Lily, probably not much time with Luke, you know, maybe, you know, year or two and Allie, you know, four or five, right. Maybe. So, um, so anyways, that's, that's, that's my commitment for the next, you know, within the next 90 days, I want each one of my kids to, to be able to articulate that for me. And again, the rules, you got to be specific. You can't do something, can't make it a joke, can't make it. It's got to be specific. It's got to be real. Got to be truthful. All righty. I think, do we got anything else for relations? We did the good husband, wife stuff, good fathers, kid, or, or parents, kids stuff, and, and good single, single stuff. I, well, I, I think it's not just uh, romantic relationships and family, but also friendships. Like how can you be a better friend Yeah. or, or maybe fostering a friendship with somebody that maybe you're acquainted with that you get along with, but you haven't really spent the time to kind of foster a friendship with and really dig any deeper, maybe having a little more contact in that. Yeah. All right, so let's let, let's look at a uh, let's kind of wrap uh, wrap up some of these I've, things we talked about. I've got a um, I I've got something that I want to read off as a potential conclusion to or to help tee up a conclusion. Yeah, it's it's a brief paragraph that that somebody wrote um that I think in some ways encapsulates why we're talking about this and and why it's relevant to some of our previous episodes that we've um that we've covered. Here's Go what ahead. this person has to say. Um. Uh, democracy is not only a system, but rather a vector with an unmistakable direction. Democracy and progressive democracy are synonymous and indistinguishable from the expansion of the state. While extreme right-wing governments have, on rare occasions, momentarily arrested this process, its reversal lies beyond the bounds of democratic possibility. Since winning elections is overwhelmingly a matter of vote-buying, in society's informal organs, education and the media, are no more resistant to bribery than the electorate. 
a thrifty politician is simply an incompetent politician. And the democratic variant of Darwinism quickly eliminates such misfits from the gene pool. This is a reality that the left applauds, the establishment right begrudgingly accepts, and the libertarian right has ineffectively rallied against. Increasingly, however, libertarians have ceased to care whether anyone is paying attention to them. They have been looking for something else entirely, an exit. Hmm. All righty. I, I, I mean, I, I think in some ways that like fully encapsulates what we just talked about in today's episode, what we talked about in some ways with Thursday's episode and what we've talked about in some of our previous episodes about like why the dollar is going to go under. Like, yeah. I, I think that libertarian and, and libertarians, I mean, this in a small L sense, like they are looking for an exit. And, and, and here's what I mean by exit. Yeah, I just want to pack up and move to the mountains and not come back I mean, down. They're looking for in some ways, gulch. That, that, is a, that is one of multiple different things that can describe an exit. What, what they're looking for is a way to get around how the current political system is barreling towards catastrophe, and they don't want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason that this guy said that libertarians are looking for an exit um, rather than anybody to pay attention to them is because people on the left, there's actually, there, there, there's, there's two lines from a, um, from a post from salon.com actually, that I think encapsulates how the left views this and they look at it uh, with glee. There's this guy on the left that wrote on salon and he said, the dread of democracy by libertarians and classical liberals is justified. Libertarianism really is incompatible with democracy. Most libertarians have made it clear which of the two they prefer. The only question that remains to be settled is why anyone should pay any attention to libertarians. And so this guy in response, you know, his, his, his response was libertarians don't care if anybody's paying attention to them. <laughs> They're looking for an exit door. Yeah. They, they don't even want to participate in the process anymore because they see that the process is leading towards catastrophe. They're, they see the plane is crashing or the train is about to derail. They're looking to jump off the train, not be part of the train wreck. Yeah. One well, and I think that one of the things that whenever I, I try to make a point of this too. A lot of times when I talk to students, we we keep seeing this we keep seeing this world, and the reason why we're talking about this day, we keep seeing this world where we're basically we're being told this is the only option. We have to fight over political parties to decide who's going to control the other, right? And and democracy is being used almost synonymously with freedom, and that's garbage. Democratic processes may be an important way to make certain decisions. It's an absolutely horrible way to make most of your decisions. Most of the things that you do throughout your life are not decided democratically. It's you making decisions with what you want to do with your time, your talents, your treasure, your property. That's what it is. You don't want a democratic process deciding all of that. You want to decide it. That's what freedom is. And instead, we're, get, we're, getting, we're being told, no, 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 this is about you picking which team is going to run Washington, D.C. to tell you how to do everything. Well, screw you. I don't want to do any of that. And shocker. The last hundred yeah. years of history, yeah. it's the progressive left that wins 90% of the time. Yeah. Even when you temporarily get a Reagan revolution. Here's a question for you. Is America more to the left today than it was in 1979? Not 1980, 1979, yeah. before Reagan. Was America more to the left today oh, yeah. no than it question. was in 1979? I don't think anybody with a brain would, would answer no to that question. Yeah. America's absolutely more to the left today than it was in 1979, which tells you the Reagan revolution merely delayed the the endless march to the left that, yeah. that we've seen, again, for, for, for over a century, since yeah. the progressive era, at least since the progressive era. And so... I mean, basically, I think that increasingly people in our political sphere realize that that modern day conservatism is is basically progressivism driving the speed limit. Mm -hmm. and, and, <laughs> and, wow. and and so, like, if that's the if the alternative is we're going to end in disaster sooner or later, but no matter what, the end state is the end state. Again, most people on that, that agree with us politically are going to be like, well, I'm, if the train is going to crash inevitably, the question is, is it going to crash a mile down the track or a hundred miles down the track? I would rather get off the train as soon as possible. Well, here, here's so here's let, let's kind of consolidate all of this, right? This is the making the argument section. 
And somebody pointed this out on here. You know, again, we weren't set up as a democracy in the sense of just pure majoritarian rule. We were, we were set up as a constitutional republic that relies upon democratic processes to select politicians and for those politicians to make decisions with what was supposed to be a very lim limited and enumerated powers at the federal level. And obviously we've gone way past that. And now we're being told, no, 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 this is all about democracy and whoever happens to be controlling the reins of power, well, as long as they got there democratically, then what they do is somehow just or okay or, or you're still living in a free country. When in reality, we all know that's not true. What's, what's true is that genuine freedom is you being able to live your life is the way you want, provided you're not infringing on the right of other people to do the same thing. That's freedom. That's true. And, and the reason why we have any government whatsoever was to, to solve very, very limited problems for which government could be appropriate. And instead, we're being told that, no, 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 there's nothing for which government cannot touch or be involved in or should uh, interact with. And so when you look at the things that we've just talked about here, right, it, if you want the sort of government that I, that I described, the one where the government stays within its limited constitutionally enumerated powers, and you are generally free to do what you want, provided you don't infringe on the, if you want that, okay, we're a long way from what that is. We're a long way from what that is. Are we still freer than most places on earth? Yes, but we're getting less so year after year, and people are looking for what is the way that we combat this? And what they've been told is get more involved in politics. And you know what? I don't disagree with people being more aware and being more involved in politics. But ultimately, if you want people to leave a, if you want people to leave a train wreck that is moving toward the government, controlling more and more of your food, your health care, your education, your housing, and, and this, this assumption that politicians are supposed to be responsible for all of this because they'll somehow do a good job, even though they never do, mm -hmm. right? If you, want, if you want something different from that, we're going to have to actually show people what it looks like. Right? It's no longer good to just theorize about it. And yes, there's a lot of examples in society that we can point to that do a good job of intentional communities and things like that where they actually provide it. But the reason why we went through this whole process of discussing what can you do for the next 90 days that isn't political? Well, we, what did we talk about? We talked about the intellectual. What are some of the things that you can actually <clears throat> equip yourself with so that when you are talking to people who are willing to listen, you can actually make a good argument for what it is that you believe and why. What, what are the ways that you win the intellectual arguments? What are the ways that you use logic and reason and evidence in order to arrive at conclusions that make sense so that people are willing to consider it and potentially try it? That's why we laid the books that we laid out, Road to Serfdom, uh, the Book of Philippians and the Bible, The Laws of Human Nature, uh, The Law by Frederick Bastiat. If we said anything by Thomas Sowell, pick one of these. If one of the books we've mentioned is one you haven't read before, pick one and over the next 90 days, read it with the intention of not just getting through cover to cover, read it with the intention of genuinely understanding what are the ideas and concepts that they're trying to convey and how can I use these ideas and concepts and, and then modify what they're talking about into maybe practical modern day situations if it's an older book. What are the ways that I can use this in order to change the way I think about something or potentially argue in favor of something good to somebody else? That's the intellectual. If you abandon the intellectual, then what you're really abandoning is the ability to convince. Next, what do we talk about? We talked about the physical. Again, stay in shape because one, it's good for you. It's healthy. It's attractive. Those things are all positive. One of the things that you're doing with, with this whole idea of convincing somebody of a different way of thinking is that you're showing that believing these things equals good results, right? Being in a, being in a position, and again, whether it's in a, a bad situation or a good situation, the more healthy you are, that speaks well of what you believe in the things that you're doing within your life. Plus, I'll say it right now, if you're a man, you're supposed to be able to defend things physically. I'm not saying everyone's got to be a, 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 you know, a, a monster or an MMA. It's not that. It's about... If you're going to enter into a situation at some point in your life where you're now responsible for the protection of your wife and your children, start developing the skills and capabilities to be able to effectively do that. Don't tell me how frustrated you are about with the government you know, in, involving themselves in everything and then turn around and tell me, oh, but I want a woman to marry me even though I possess none of the capabilities necessary to protect them. If you really think we're going toward a dangerous world, a more dangerous world than the one we already have, 
Well, then start taking seriously your responsibility to stay in shape and protect your family. And that's where we talked about some of these seals. And again, and this applies to women as well. All right, then we talk about capabilities and skills. This is the part that I always think is really fun to talk about because it, it's amazing how many things that I, I used to do or skills. And, and, and within a complex economy, right, we generally focus on specialization and division of labor. We say, don't get good at 50 things, get really, really good at one thing. And that's, and, and you know what, there's so much truth to that in a very complex, high-tech um, economy. That, that is how you produce great wealth. That's how you produce great special, you know, um, um, goods and services is by specialization. But that doesn't need that doesn't need to mean that you focus entirely on a particular skill set that's useful for your profession and then nothing else. Actually engaging in the process of learning new skills is valuable in and of itself. It's valuable because it teaches you how to research, how to think, how to problem solve. But then it also it adds additional capabilities that you never know when you're going to use it. One of the one of the simplest things my mother ever said to me that has stuck with me. She goes, "Nick, sometimes it's just good to know things." And that sounds like very very simple and basic, but she was she was talking about it in the context of you never know when a particular piece of information or a skill or a capability might end up being critical. And, and she really fostered in us this idea of, of learning to, to learn and experience and develop those capabilities that always make you not only valuable, right, in, in a market sense, but valuable with respect to your family, with respect to your spouse, with respect to your kids, with respect to your friends. And so taking the time to learn some of these skill sets that will not only make you more resilient. So like, yeah, if it all comes crashing down, you've got food because you know how to garden. You know how to raise livestock. But if it doesn't all come crashing down, your food was not the one filled up with all this crap. Your food was not the one that you showed up to the grocery store one day and realized it's not there because we have a major supply chain crisis. And oh, by the way, your government's making it worse, not better. You're not the one whose kids were dealing with allergies and you're wondering which sort of thing to take next, realizing that maybe some of it has, it has an impact because of the food that they're eating. right? So th those sort of skill sets that you're developing are good either way. In crisis, not in crisis. Not to mention the fact that there's there's something I think very therapeutic about and, and teaching your kids responsibility about raising animals, about being responsible for fostering life and growing it and nurturing it. Um, we, we talked about the other things too with respect to developing skill sets within, this, within the time frame that we're operating in right now. Like being able to in, effectively engage with the culture is critical. Being able to pass on knowledge is critical. If you're tired of what the schools are doing with your child, you can get in a 10-year political battle in the hopes that it changes, or you can look for the exit. And sometimes the only way to accomplish the sort of political change that you want to see is to stop playing the game the way the politicians demand that you play it. All right? You can change the rules right now on so many things in your life. So many things with respect to your children's life and education. But learning how to do these things and respecting that other people have developed the time and the skill sets and are, are offering it to you for free. Take advantage of it. Stop buying into the idea that, well, no, this is the way I have to do it because a politician told me and that person has a master's degree. That master's degree might be valuable. It might be crap. Right? Right? What makes it valuable is not the fact that they have it. What makes it valuable is their ability to actually transfer knowledge and information on to other people. Well, guess what? You got a whole bunch of people dying to give it to you for free. And all you got to do is take a little time developing it. And then when you have those experiences, you develop it and you share it. And you might be doing it for purely altruistic reasons or because you're patriotic and you want to save your country or because you want to actually save your child's education. But you never know when something like that actually ends up becoming profitable. So develop the skill sets and do it. And then finally, when we talked about this piece about relationships, <clears throat> you know, when we, when we let off with how do you build an intentional community, well, the first thing you do is you find like-minded people. You know, we, we, find that in, we find that in church. We find that in civic organizations. We find that in a variety of areas. And then how do you foster those relationships to where you are a good spouse, you are a good parent, you are a good friend? You're someone that can actually interact, meaningful, meaningful interaction within a community. I'm going to share this story real quick. 
Because one of the most frustrating things that I hear whenever I talk about the government shouldn't be doing this or that, I always get told, well, if the government didn't do it, who would? And I said, you know, do not mistake the fact that I don't require assistance, you know, now necessarily in the form of public assistance. Like, do not confuse that with not knowing what it is to be poor, with not knowing what it is to have my power turned off because I couldn't pay the bill. I know what that feels like. I also know what it feels to qualify for all of that different government assistance that they are constantly throwing at you and offering you and say, no, I'm not going to take it, but we still needed help. And then all of a sudden, family or friends or someone from your church stands up and, and provides you with that assistance you desperately needed in a time when you desperately needed it. That doesn't breed the sort of entitlement that the government system does. It breeds a genuine sense of community. And part of developing these sort of skill sets is putting yourself in a position to benefit you, to benefit your family, but also to benefit that person that genuinely needs it. So that when somebody says, well, if the government didn't do it, who would? The answer is, I will. My family will. Our church will. Our organization will. We'll do it. Because we want genuine community. We want genuine community based off of genuinely fulfilling the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, not some sort of redistributive forced government transfer system which elevates politicians and makes the rest of us dependent on their largesse, their ability to effectively steal from someone else in order to give it to me. I don't ever want to have to support myself based off of stolen goods. I don't want to do it and I don't want someone to do it on my behalf. I want to do it because I was creating something of valuable that somebody else was willing to exchange with me. And so as we look at all of this, this is what this is about. It's about developing the skills. It's about improving oneself in part so that when somebody tells us, no, 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 it has to be done this way, you will participate in what the political class has told you to participate in. You don't have to. And most importantly, you don't have to be scared when they threaten you with what happens if you don't participate. We'll take your job. We'll cancel you. We'll make you a social pariah. Well, you know what? Do what you got to do. Because I know I have an intentional community within my family, within my sphere of friends. I know I have people that we will work together and we'll get through this. And we'll be the ones that provide for our care, for our food, for our housing, for our clothing. Not because we're, we're unwilling to exchange in the greater marketplace. We're absolutely willing to do that. We're just not going to be bound by any sort of system where politicians tell us that they're the ones that are going to decide for us. And that's what all this is about. And the fact that it's actually fun. Everything we talked about here today is, is not something that's some sort of grueling task where you got to engage in a bunch of activities you don't want to do. Pick one thing from each category. Pick one thing from each category that you're going to do for the next 90 days to try it out. The thing that sounds the most fun to you. Because ultimately, I absolutely believe that that it's, it's not just a willingness to sacrifice, which is incredibly important at times. It's not just a willingness to sacrifice that it's going to convince people of what we're talking about right here. It's when they see us experiencing joy and peace and love and community in the midst of their chaos. All right. I want to thank everyone for, for sticking with us this whole time. Thank you, everyone, for that's been watching and offering us uh, suggestions on this. We're going to come back. We're, we'll probably address this at other episodes. We'll just ask people, hey, where, where are you guys at? Where are you guys at in your 90-day, your summer challenge, whatever it is? June, July, August. That's where you got, you got time to think about it. We're not into June yet, but we're almost there. Got time to think about it. Which one of these things from these categories? What book are you going to read? What skill set are you going to develop? What communities are you going to help foster and join? You know, what sort of relationships are, are you going to improve within this time period? And you're going to be intentional about it. You're going to be intentional about it. For 90 days, you're going to think about this stuff. You're going to do stuff. And you're going to improve yourself, your family, your community, your country. Thank you very much for joining us. And we will see you next episode.